Hey, everybody. Welcome to We Had Ward, a Doof Media podcast series where we dissected and discussed Ward while Bo's returned to the world of parahumans. My name was Matt Freeman, and this was my co-host, Scott Daly. Yes, this was the weekly podcast where Matt and I eagerly dove into Wild Bo's world of reaching out, pushing forward, and of course, alien-based death powers as we analyzed and interpreted this concluded web serial. This week, we're discussing Arc 1 Daybreak through Arc 20 last. Matt, what did you think about this book? Uh, well, Scott, I'm in denial that this is really the end. Um, and also, it's impossible to talk about an almost two million word book in any kind of cogent or <laughs> comprehensive way. So I'm really looking forward to working through all this with you today in real time. Yeah, um, that's kind of what we're going to be doing um, this this episode. We are live right now to a bunch of people in stream on YouTube. So for those of you listening to this episode after the fact, um, you're going to hear us interact with the stream throughout this episode. Sorry about that. Uh, It's the final finale. Final. I can't even talk. It's the finale. We wanted to do something cool and different. So we thought we would do this episode live. So we're going to be doing that. And holy crap, we can't we can't possibly say anyone's name because there's too many of them. Hi, everyone. There are a lot of people here. Um, (laughs) Welcome. Great to see everyone. Um, This is going to make it even more emotional than it was already going to be. Yeah, it Um, is. It is. It's going to be really hard to keep up with the chat, but, you know, have fun and we might uh, we, we might react to the chat um, here and there. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to be trying reacting to the chat as much as possible. Um, we're also going to be I think we have our, our mailbag questions a little bit later in the episode. We're going to try to take some questions from the audience if we have time um, and then uh, we're going to we're going to get right into it. So I think the, the plan for this episode is to just kind of talk about um, Ward. You know, just mm-hmm. that book, that book we read, we're going to talk about it for a while. We're going to talk about what we thought of the book overall. We're going to talk about the experience of us following a web serial live, which is something that I had never done. I know you had done before, but this was a new experience for me. Um, we're going to kind of do a postmortem on We've Got Ward on what we learned about story, what we learned about ourselves and do a little bit of a self review and self critique. Um, and then we're going to read and answer some questions. So, um, that's 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 our episode. That's our episode. And I think we're going to conclude it with talking about what's next, talking about what's after Ward. Get, get it? Because it's, uh, it's that, uh, that is on par with the quality of the puns <laughs> that we are known for here at Doof Media. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess let's just get right into it and let's talk about this this story overall. Let's talk about this book. Let's talk about this experience. It, it was, you know, two and a half years of our lives reading the story and, and analyzing the story and talking about the story. And Matt, what are your feelings here at the end of this, this marathon? what do you think about this book? God, I mean, <laughs> but like, like I said a second ago, like it's, it's, it's difficult to react to something this big. Right. And especially, sure. I mean, that's maybe one thing to talk about right off the bat is like, I'm just going to have to reread it, you know? And, and I haven't had time to, obviously, um, it, it would, it would take literal weeks to reread even on a binge. And, uh, you know, what we, what we just did, we're so far away from what happened at the beginning of the book that it's frankly kind of hard to remember. I mean, luckily yeah, we spent yeah. hours and hours talking about it, which makes it slightly easier to remember. And we spent the whole last two years thinking about it pretty hard, which makes it mm-hmm. a bit easier to remember, but it's very hard for me to sort of hang, you know, a handle on this story and say, um, this is what I feel about. It. I mean, in, in, in short, um, I loved it. Uh, it changed me as a person. I think it made me better as a person. Um, uh, it, it changed the way I see a lot of situations, um, in real life. Uh, it, it probably changed the way I think about storytelling and the way I think about analyzing stories. And, you know, beyond that, I would have to start digging into like individual things about the story. And we could talk about that in detail. I mean, obviously, that's what we do here. And I'd love to do that with you. But before we do that, what did you think about this book, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I kind of I I do want to dive into what you said about how it it made you a better person and changed you, because I think that's such an important thing to to really explore. But and and the reason I'm starting with that is because I, I I agree with you. I think I think that this story, like this experience and this story was one of those things that I will treasure for the rest of my life. Like, um, I, I agree that it's very difficult to look at this book and just sit down and say, okay, what, what was bored to me? What was the story to me? And it's almost by designed a sprawling epic journey that, um, that is not 
easily simplified, right? Like I think like we have a tendency when we're looking back on the story to kind of flatten it down to the main story beats. Like you can you can go, okay, that was the goddess arc. Okay, that was the March arc. Like that was that was the teacher arc. And and you just kind of flatten the story down. And like, that's not giving it enough credit because within each one of those arcs was a thousand mini arcs and, and hundreds of complex things happening at the same time. Yeah. Um, and it's so, it's so, so difficult. Um, but I, I overall love this experience. Like, I, I don't think there was, there was a time in reading this book where I wasn't looking forward to reading the next chapter where I wasn't looking forward to coming on here and talking about it. Um, I think, you know, to do a project like this on a book you love is a lot of work. If, if I wasn't loving it, it would be, (laughs) it would be, oh my gosh, like the most exhausting thing ever. Mm -hmm. And I, I never felt that like there were times when I was tired and when I didn't want to spend eight hours prepping for the show, but, um, I enjoyed I enjoyed every moment of recording it. I enjoyed every moment of reading it. And I think I think that the the things that the story is doing, the level of difficulty with this story, especially when you compare it to Worm, is like astonishing. Mm-hmm. I, I really I really do think so. I, I think, you know, I, I kind of want to talk about the idea of complexity in storytelling in the relation to this book and, and specifically the relation between Worm and Ward. And I don't want to do a lot of comparing of these two stories because I think there's been a lot of like, well, which one did you like better? And I don't really want to answer that question because I loved both of them and that's all I need to know. Like, I don't need to rank them. I don't need to sit down and dive through my thoughts of which one is better or worse than another. I couldn't even say that until I've read both. And and even then I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm the kind of person where my favorite rotates on a daily basis. So sure, sure, sure. Fair. Um, I, I, but I think, I think this is a more complex story mm-hmm. than Worm was. And I don't I don't mean that in 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 the way that like I'm denigrating Worm. I I think Worm is a wonderful 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 book. I think it's it's doing very complicated things. And that's why like complexity is a weird word because if you say if you say Ward's a more complex story than Worm, it sounds like you're saying Worm is simple and it's not, it's not a simple story. It's the themes are complicated. The things it's doing are complicated, but the way it's doing them are simpler. Mm -hmm. If you know what I mean? Like, and I think, you know, people joke about my ability to predict things. And I think that's because Worm was a story that was more like, see, I don't want to say more predictable because that's bad. Like it was, it wasn't, it's not that it was more predictable. It was adhering to narrative structure, tr- traditional narrative structure in a lot, m- in a more traditional way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think that, I think Ward has this, this fairly big cast of, of really well-developed characters. We've mm-hmm. got basically breakthrough, right? Vic, uh, you know, w- Ward is about Victoria, but Ward is also about uh, uh, breakthrough, you know? Yeah, and sure, and sure. all these characters have very different motivations and different needs and different wants. And so the story is pulled in all kinds of interesting directions where you just couldn't predict it because you just can't account for all the different elements and the ways in which things play out and play off of each other. Sure, sure. Um, there's just there's just more just more going on. And, yeah. and I think that, that a lot of that is because, yeah, we've got this core cast of breakthrough characters Um and and I think, like you said, it's 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 much less of a standard sort of narrative structure. Like I can't hang any sort of convenient label on like what kind of story is this? It's like, OK, yeah. well, superhero story, but that doesn't really help mm-hmm. at all. Um, that's barely the genre. Right. That That's it's it's sort of it's sort of a post apocalyptic story, but also it's got this um it's like a different take on the post-apocalypse than I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, it's sort of a superhero story, but it's, it, it takes that in a direction that you've never really seen anywhere else, including worm. So um, yeah, I, I agree completely with that take. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things that I really want to kind of talk about here, and, and we're seeing a lot of people in the chat that are kind of agreeing with us, I think Jess says worm is straightforward mostly. Yeah. And again, I think the things that it's dealing with are complex, but the way in which it does it, uh, sim- more straightforward, I think is right. Don says that the difference between an author's first work and a decade of experience. And that actually, I think that's great because, and I totally agree with that because that's kind of why I wanted to 
I wanted to go right into this book. I mean, we, we were finished with Worm and you and I were like, okay, what do we do next? Do we go on to one of the other serials or do we hop right into Ward? And one of the reasons I wanted to hop right into the story is because I wanted to see, I, I thought that the difference in the talent of the writing would be much more easily noticeable um, if you go from first work to latest work. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I think that that bore out, in my opinion, I think this is this is a a better written story. Like, I think that's where the complexity like Wild Bo is, is making big swings and taking risks here. I mean, I think just just framing the theme of your story around the concept of, you know, pushing forward around recovery, around acceptance. Um, it's difficult because these are themes that are so often not very satisfying. Like mm-hmm. if you want, if you want to explore them correctly, like if, if you want to explore them in a traditional narrative structure, then you have like a, a light switch moment of acceptance. And then at, that comes at the climax and then that's it. And everything's perfect. We did it and we go home and we're happy. Um, if, if you want to capture these things realistically, it's often not very satisfying because it's incremental. It's, you know, the, the refrain in the story was two steps forward, one step back. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's, it's so it's like, there's so much going on there and it's such a challenging thing to do and to, to get in a satisfying way still. Um, and I, I like, I have so much respect for just the, just like just the attempt at making a story like this, let alone the execution. Yeah. Right, let alone pulling it off, right? Because I, I right, agree. Right. I've never, I've never seen another story. It, it, this is weird. This is weird to say, but like I, it feels like I can no longer take quite as seriously the catharsis offered by other stories after reading this. <laughs> you could almost say Ward has ruined stories for me. Um, that's, now, that's something people say about Worm. Uh, it's true, actually. I, I was, I was sort of joking, but the point. <laughs> The, the the point of saying that is, is that like um once you once you realize like okay well well obviously like a two hour film is never ever really going to be able to bring you the kind of like spiritual um soul searching uh you know questioning questioning your own life and and you know looking at characters like Tristan and and Rain maybe and asking yourself like hey do I have a little bit of that in me um you know, f- forcing you to confront all these things and then bringing you through to the point at the end of the story where you see how different characters have processed these things over the course of two million words, especially Victoria, I would say, where mm-hmm. her kind of moment of catharsis is the one out of all of literature where I would say, like, yes, that is exactly nailing, like, the feeling of, like, a true actual uh, change in a person. Because it just it just seems like so many stories they want to convince you their character has changed, but they just have to be like, you know, you know what that's like. Moving on, <laughs> right, um, right. I mean, I, I think I think the this book wants to take that you know you know what that's like and say no, we're going to talk about that for uh, uh, a million words, <laughs> and we're going to really dive into that. Um, I think I think that's kind of where I wanted to talk to you about the concept of serialized storytelling, because that's another reason why I wanted to do this book next with you was because I had never followed on with a show serially with a book serially like this. And I I do think this is such a unique, interesting kind of way to tell a story. Um, And I don't think I experienced it when I was reading Ward because I was not reading Worm. I, I was not reading Worm the way the way that I read Ward at all. Like, even though I, I stretched it out a little bit and we did it over the course of nine months, I think it was, it still really wasn't the experience of reading two chapters a week, every week over the course of almost three years. It's just not the same. And what I found in this is that a web serial to me is less like a book and more like a TV show. And what I mean by that is it's this sprawling, thing that exists at multiple times throughout its its runtime like it exists constantly mm-hmm. and it, it like Wild Bill talks a lot about his triangle of the the reader um the text and the writer triangle and i think that's a triangle that that exists in television a lot too and it's not like one of the things i think he talked about 
feedback and and listening to his readers a lot in his postmortem thing. Um, and he he talked about like, you know, adjusting things based on listener feedback. And, and I think I think the th- interesting thing about this is I don't I don't take that to be as like someone writes a post about how X should be different. And then Wild Bo makes X different. I think it's more like the same way you, TV shows do where they're gauging audience response. They're seeing who's responding to what. And I think the biggest thing to me is. Are my listeners slash readers slash watchers getting what I were, was trying to set down mm-hmm. and adjusting based off of whether they were getting that or not? And that's a thing that novels cannot do. That's a thing that movies cannot do. That is a thing that TV shows can do. And that is a thing that the that serials like this can do. Um, and I, I think that's a wholly unique way of 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 absorbing this material. And and like we've talked a lot about the sprawl and how you can really, really spread out in that way. Um, and and I, I, I find that remarkable. And I think that was one of the most rewarding experiences of me seeing like I, I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I talk about Buffy the Vampire Slayer a lot. I know I know uh, that Wild Bo enjoys that show a lot, too. And I love the ways in which I saw the moments of this book similar in similar ways to which I saw the moments of that television show where, Mm. where an arc of that show is like a season and it relates to the overall story in that it's dealing with these characters and the themes and and what they're doing, but it also is its own little story. And I think that's what allowed the sprawl to kind of happen in this story in an interesting way. And Mm -hmm. it's just like, the more I think about it, the more I think television, this is just like television. Um, And I love television. Yeah. Well, I've always, Maybe I've never actually said this out loud, uh, interestingly, but I've always thought of writing a web serial as more like a performance than writing a novel. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you can make the comparison to comedians. Uh, uh, Comedians are always talking about how they absolutely could not what like you can't be a comedian who just like writes your jokes, writes a set of jokes, goes up on the stage and performs those jokes. And then that is how you be a comedian. You have to. You have to write the jokes, yes, but then you have to do some ad-libbing on the stage and some improv. Mm-hmm. You have to tell the jokes in different ways and see how the audience responds to them to, to like, you know, the, your, your delivery style. Yeah, like, like yeah. Like no, no comedian knows actually how a joke is going to be received, which is really amazing. Even the super successful ones, all of your favorite comedians, none of them – None of them just like write a set and they're like, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to kill and, and then deliver it, right? That doesn't happen. And this is what a web, like this is the cool thing about a web serial is that the web serial author is writing a thing, putting it out into the world and basically getting a chance to hear the proverbial, the, the, the proverbial you know, laughter of the audience to, to get yeah, the reaction yeah. and, and see, okay, what what's landing the way I want it to? What are they picking up on that I'm not even intending that I might want to play with? What are they picking up on that I – didn't intend at all that I want to try to distance myself from, you know, right, just right. A, there's a whole, um, I mean, a whole spectrum of, of, of reactions that you get. And that, that basically gives, um, the web serial author a kind of feedback loop, a very tight feedback loop, similar to the comedian or really any performer performing in front of a live audience yeah. where they very quickly know what they're getting right and what they're getting wrong and they can calibrate. And while Wild has been doing this for, I mean, is it really 10 years? I, I don't, it's just about, just about yeah, 10 years. But yeah. Like his, his OODA loop, if you will, has gotten real high, really well calibrated, I think, and and it really shows here because, um, as you said, uh, uh, he's extremely, you know, aware of of kind of the effect of, of his writing, and it's just gotten like better and better, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, I I I really like that analogy a lot. I mean, I, I and I I agree with you. I think I I think it's it's just it kind of comes like it's it's difficult to understand how feedback works in this regard, right? It's not like, like it's, it's more uh, an overall feeling. Like I think everything in this story, I think a a simplified way of looking at feedback is uh, people complained about X. So X was changed or people wanted more Y. So there was more Y it's more that feedback goes into the already existing plans of the story. Mm. And then those plans of the story pivot and move around those things in interesting ways in, in, in a way that makes the story feel alive um, in, in a way in which that normal um, novel based storytelling is not. So I, I, I find it, I find it 
such a fascinating thing. And that's why, like, I know there's there's a lot of people out there that's like, hey, don't 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 listen to the feedback. And like, that's no, <laughs> like that's the that's the whole point of doing it this way. Right. Like, would you why would you make a, a serialized story this way if you didn't want to kind of kind of take people on this roller coaster and see how they're liking each each loop of the roller coaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I think I get that. I think, you know, it was, uh, b- back at the start of worm. And even I think when I, when I was reading uh, Harry Potter and the methods of rationality, which was really my first exposure to serialized written fiction, I was like, Oh, this is cheat codes. Like the, these, these authors, they get feedback in a, in a way where they're just going to get better and better. They're get, they're mm-hmm. going to, nobody's going to be able to catch up with them. They're going to be the best in the world. And, it's, and I, I was like, I was instantly sold on this concept of serials. So yeah, it's been really fun. Yeah. It's been really fun being able to do this with you. I mean, this show has been so different from, um, we've got worm, right? <laughs> it's just yeah, yeah. very, very different, uh, in, in, in in more ways than I don't I can even really count yeah. off actually. Yeah, and let, let me let me like because we're getting some comments in in chat and I, and I want to be clear about feedback. Like, it's not that you should listen to every single bit of feedback you get. It's not that you should ignore every little bit of feedback you get. Um, it's just that this is it, it is something that an author has to gauge and has to deal with constantly. Um, Mm -hmm. but I, I do think it's an important part. Like everyone wants feedback, like everyone wants feedback in their stuff. It's just whether that feedback is solicited or not, whether that feedback, um, is, is helpful or not. And, and it's like, it's, it's a difficult thing to, to Mm -hmm. gauge. So for sure. Well, the way I would see it is, um, um, if a comedian tells a joke on the stage and the joke bombs and nobody laughs, that's, they need that feedback. Mm-hmm. They need that. Like that's not that's not like optional, right? Like that, you, you, it's it's pretty easy to see in that particular case, right? Like, sure, look, sure. it's not working. You need to do something, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, um, I, I think, I think, I, you know, in a million small ways, that that is the function that the feedback should serve. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't, I, I didn't plan on going down this rabbit hole. I just, I just think this is this is one of the more fascinating aspects of this kind of storytelling to me yeah um yeah this this part of the show is not actually planned we're just kind of talking about the experience and about about the story and yeah we got bullet points <laughs> yeah we got we had some bullet points i mean you know what one one bullet point that i just had here that i kind of wanted to hit on is is how um like i i, I just love the way Wildbo writes and <laughs> And, I'm and, sorry. I know. I know you're gonna you're gonna expand upon that, period. but I, but your bullet point is I enjoy the way Wild Bo writes, uh-huh. the and that's the, and that's the show. Yeah, there we go. Show. We did it. Yeah. <laughs> In case you hadn't picked up on that, no. But but like specifically here, talking about the way that he takes like some ideas, or even just like an idea with a million different facets and ways of of turning it and looking at it, mm-hmm. and just lets it play out, and just lets it play out and lets it play out, and it's like. You know, we, we talk, we, we've talked about recovery or, or, you know, acceptance, which are sort of intertwined ideas already where it's like, well, where does one begin and the other end? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, obviously, obviously acceptance is something that, it, that some of these characters need to do on their way to recovery. And then there's some characters who their arc is sort of more about the opposite of acceptance or the opposite of recovery, whatever, the, sure. whatever those yeah. words would be. And, you, you know, you've got you've got characters who did really bad things and they have a lot of guilt and they have to accept, you know, and, and move past the fact that they were the ones who were responsible for something awful. And then you've got characters who are victims who, who had terrible things done to them who need to learn how to, how to, how to deal with that. And may, maybe that's via a path of forgiveness. Maybe it's not via a path of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe forgiveness has nothing to do with it actually. And, and then you've got, you've even got people who bad things just happened to with nobody responsible, you know, um, like, like, like all of these different things. And I'm just, I'm just scratching the surface. I'm just sort of like b- briefly rattling off like top level features of a handful of the most important characters. All of these things then like refract into the further, the further details of the story and the characters in increasingly intricate and complicated ways. And, mm-hmm. um, I just, I find it inspiring, frankly. It, it makes me like think like what, like it's it's one of those things where you see like where you see somebody doing something that should be impossible, and they're doing it successfully, and you're like, okay, yeah. 
that raises my level of of like what's possible actually successfully at a rate uh, at a rate heretofore uh, unknown to me like the the speed at which like it should be commended that mm. like it's not just the complexity and the talent of the writing um it's the speed at which that happens i mean to me one of one of the most wonderful tricks a writer can pull to me is making something seem like it was set up that way the entire time when it totally wasn't. And it's Mm. just something that occurred to the writer, but they're just able to like manipulate the narrative in a way that makes it seem like this is the way it was always going to go. And I think that's one of what's one of wild most greatest talents is his ability to just take. And we talked about this all throughout worm and throughout ward, but to just take like a dangling thread and just say, Oh wait, this, this ties perfectly here. And then when you finish tying it, you can't even see you can't even see that it was ever not a, a solid thread. Like it, you can't even see that there was ever a disconnect between those two threads. That's where that was always going to go. Even if it wasn't it, like it wasn't, but it just looks like that on, on our end. And that's like one of the magics, magic things of writing to me. And I think this story does that so well, mm-hmm. like, over and over again, we had these things, we had these moments that we were like, like in retrospect, it just looks like, oh, of course, of course, that's the way it was always going to go. And and I I, I don't know, right? Like I, I am not Wild Bo, I do not know his brain, but I, I do know enough about writing to know that some of these things just occur to you at the moment and you connect them in satisfying ways. I think Wild Bo has said that, you know, part of the fun of writing serials is that he is sort of finding out these things when we do. Um, right, right, I, right. I, I believe on the all packed up interview, he he mentioned something about. I oh, know I don't remember where he mentioned this, but he's definitely mentioned some specific thing that happened in Worm, where I was like, "No way was that <laughs> no, like surely that was planned out, and it was and it was one of these you know major plot events, major major character choice made by Taylor that was like, no, nah, this is just what she would do, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think it was how how does she get out of the cafeteria or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I I remember I remember hearing about that. I don't remember where it was, but um yeah, that it's great. I mean, that's that's writing is such it's it's like magic. It's like magic. And when it when when the illusion works on you, it's like nothing else in the world mm-hmm. to me. And that's why I love it. Um yeah. Do you want to spend some time on Victoria for a bit? Sure. Because I think we it's she's our protagonist. She's our our way into the story and our our key to the story and and I, why do you think we loved her so much? <laughs> She's just so fully realized, right? Mm-hmm. It's um, I, I think one fun thing for me. And this is maybe not exactly talking about Victoria, talking about the show and Victoria. But one mm-hmm. one fun thing for me was like I already, I already knew that Wild Bill can write very different characters because I had read more than one Wild Bill story. Yeah, but I was I was I was getting into this. I was like excited to see like number one who is this new person going to be because I'm sure they're going to be someone who I fall in love with in the same way we all did Taylor. And I was also kind of excited to watch you realize, Oh, wild Bo's actually a really fucking good writer <laughs> because, because <laughs> everybody, I think when you read one story by a person, by, by, by an author, you just think that's their voice. Mm-hmm. You may not realize like, no, that's, that's their voice doing that character, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was, um, but yes, Victoria, so well fleshed out, so complex dealing with things that really, really everyone deals with, but dealing with them in her own very specific way. I, I think I love that phrase, um, about, about writing that you, you need to find the general in the specific, like you don't write about trauma. You write about this one character's extremely specific trauma. And in doing so, you, you create this anchor into the general idea that yeah. we, we all have our traumas and we can all relate, we can all relate to this person. Yeah. Well, and, and I love, I love that Victoria is both a survivor and a person who has done bad things in her past as well. I mm-hmm. think that's such an interesting angle to look at it from, because like she, she is at, at the same time, like struggling with what Amy did to her all the horrible, horrible things Amy did to her. And also with the person she was before that. And, and there's a lot of, and those two things are really interconnected, right? Those two things are, are really, really just part of each other because they, they, it's kind of a feedback loop. Like this tor- terrible thing happened to me, but maybe I deserved it because I, I was this bad person before. Um, and, and that just kind of feeds like just loops on itself in these terrible ways. 
And it's just, it's, she's such like, I understand this character. I think more than I've ever understood another character in, mm. in the history of reading, like ever, ever. Um, and and yeah. that includes Taylor, who is a character I loved that I, before reading this book, I would have absolutely called, called Taylor one of my favorite characters in, in stories ever, ever. Um, and I still think that's true. But Victoria, I, I just, I just like, she is, she's so, so powerful to me. And, and like, it, it's just, I, I know it's kind of cliche to say because, of course, it wouldn't be the same story without Victoria, but I can't imagine I can't imagine these themes without a character like Victoria at the at the helm of them, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, I love that. Uh, and I, I agree completely with what you said about not feeling like I've ever known any other character in a story better than this. And that's mm-hmm. one of the things that I mean when I say this story kind of shows you, oh, like it's possible to go a level above what I thought was possible with storytelling. And uh, I think part of that is, is because Victoria is actually a much more introspective character than Taylor Mm -hmm. was like Taylor was like, like by design uh, someone with compartments, someone with blind spots, uh, someone who was not really terribly honest with herself. Whereas Victoria, um, I wouldn't say she's a hundred percent, you know, a hundred percent honest with herself all the time. I think it's impossible to be, but her blind spots are ones where it's like she's sort of working on them, even though they persist, like, like she's kind of aware of them, even though they continue to exist, which I, I I very much relate to. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like I, I I try to be an introspective person, but like trying to be introspective and being able to monitor and correct all of your own thoughts in real time are two very different things. So that that's one way in which I really, really related to her. No, I, I, I totally agree with that because like there were moments in Worm where I was like, if Taylor could just see the thing she was doing, maybe that would change her behavior and her choices. And then with Victoria, you're just like, no, you, like that's not how it works. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes you know exactly the way you're reacting, you know exactly what you're doing and it doesn't make it doesn't make that feeling go away to be aware of it. It actually in some ways makes it worse because you're like, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm reacting and I cannot stop it. I can't stop it from happening. And that makes it all the more tragic um, and, and and powerful to me. Mm-hmm. Especially toward the beginning where um, she would, you know, she'd, she'd get, she'd get stuck, you know, she, she'd mm-hmm. get, she'd get yeah. sucked into her own head in ways where I think at first she didn't even realize it was happening on a conscious level, honestly. And then gradually it became something she became more conscious of and more in control of. And, yeah. and then, you know, by the end she's not, she's not zoning out anymore. Um, it's such a great, such a great journey. Right. And it's a journey in so many different regards. Like we could just, we could probably spend an hour just talking about all of the different ways in which Victoria changed over the course of the story. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like it's, it's interesting because like, this is again, a thing in which I think where, where Ward is a more complex story than worm. If you look at Taylor, I think the ways in which Taylor changed are, are like, super readily apparent because I think it, it's a tragedy and that it's a story of this person kind of succumbing to their worst impulses, um, while doing, I mean, like I love that the tagline of, of worm is doing the wrong thing for the right reasons or something like that. Um, and basically I, I love that because it makes it seem like the story is like pro everything she's doing. Right. Mm-hmm. But actually what, 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 what it's doing is saying, look at what that that decision making does to a human being look at what that does to a person um this story is not like that like this is not a story of of a a character continually making all the wrong choices until it leads them down down a a path of destruction Mm -hmm. um this is a a story about a character finding their way forward despite all this stuff and 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 like while the story the story never like tells victoria you're wrong about certain things, right? It's not that kind of thing. It's not like, oh, Victoria made a choice here and that was the wrong choice. And the story is like, oh, Victoria, it's more internalized than that. It's less externalized. It's less the world telling Victoria she's wrong and more Victoria learning to deal with herself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I feel like um, Ward was sort of hard mode in a number of ways because, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, uh Taylor was almost a character that was engineered to make us like her, right? She's, she, 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 she fits a lot of the, the check boxes of the, the YA protagonist who you're just kind of automatically on her side. She's the young bullied student who, who, you know, a whole new world of adventure opens up to her and yeah. her dad doesn't understand her, right? Like th- these are, 
Um, these are the these are the sort of tropes that are aligned to be like, oh yeah, this is this is this kind of story. This is the good guy, and we're following along with the good guy as the good guy makes your choices. Oh, she's a villain now. That's mm-hmm. huh. Okay. Um, <laughs> and whereas this story starts out with this character who she's just like you can't summarize her right. Like there's no there's no sort of like. Uh, box that Victoria Dallin at the beginning of Ward fits into. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. well, she used to be this, and then this happened to her, yeah, and now she yeah. doesn't know. She doesn't really know what she is, and we don't really know what she is. She's she's a superhero who's not being a superhero. What is that? That's yeah, yeah. And and, and um, you know, where we go from there is is the adventure, and you know, it's it's great. I, yeah, I, I just love it. Yeah, and and like we talked about on our final show, I love the ways in which she comes full circle to like, I, I think I, I, I I'm, I'm going to repeat myself verbatim what I said last week, but I loved it so much. I love this concept so much that wild Bo brings her right back to where she was to make the ways in which she's changed all the more obvious, like just putting her right back in the patrol group and, and just slotting her right back in this, this role like makes every one of those changes so much more evident. And I think it was just such a smart thing to do, like just from a, a structural standpoint, it's like, let's put her back there. And then suddenly all those various changes just rise to the surface and call out to themselves mm-hmm. in a really interesting way that I, 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 I can't get enough. I can't get enough of the epilogue. I loved the epilogue so, so, so much. Like I, I enjoyed the epilogue of worm. I, I loved this epilogue. I loved it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, so satisfying. I think, I think that, um, I mean, the ending of, the ending of Worm was something that, that kind of stayed with me forever in an almost like, a, like a haunting way because, because there was a kind of, you know, dot, dot, dot at the end of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Whereas th- this, this was satisfying in a way where I just, you know, didn't have an actual physical book in my hands, but I could very, I could very much, I very much had the feeling of like turning the, the, the cover closed with a satisfied smile on my face. Um, at the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like that's like, I, I am sad that this book is over. I am sad that this podcast is over, but I think you're absolutely right. That satisfaction is the, the, the prevailing feeling right now Mm -hmm. that this, this has been a journey and the journey is complete. And I enjoyed every bit of that journey. And I am just sitting here like, huh, like, uh, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. And yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I I just, there's, there's something so satisfying in that. And I, I, I wanted to circle back around to something before we move on, because there's been a lot of people talking in chat about Victoria and about the ways in which Victoria from worm just comes off as this shitty person Uh and how much that informed people's opinions of Victoria going into this book. I agree with you a hundred percent on that people in chat. I think it's actually kind of what Wild Bo's doing, though. Like, I think that's like, I think it's so, it's so brilliant to take a character like Victoria, who, for the most part in Worm, was seen as this kind of like the the anti Taylor, like the person who, on the surface, had everything given to them. She's part of a superhero family. She gets she gets her powers and gets to be part of that. She gets to roam around the city doing whatever she wants, and she's got a person backing her up to do it, and she gets away with all of it. Um, and and. And yes, a horrible, horrible, horrible thing happens to her in the story, but we leave the story with her, you know, from, from our perspective at the time, we're like, oh, she's better now. Sweet, sweet. Um, and, and then we move her into the story and it's like the the book is challenging you. It's challenging your perception of this person and saying, look, there's a shitload more going on here. And, and we realize how much, like a lot of the story I think is how much we judge people versus how much we see their interiority like i will never forget how bad i felt about shortcut after just mercilessly mocking him the chapter before sure. he turns into a titan i will never forget about that yeah sure yeah no my, my my favorite thing that i did that i never talked about or or did anything with on the show itself was i, I like wrote like a joke trigger event for shortcut mm-hmm. where i like worked in all of like like references to all these things that Victoria had done to him offhand, which would then fully explain why Shortcut uh, hated her so much. Right. Um, but but like the the point, like yes, it was a joke, but it was also not really a joke because it was like this is the sort of thing that Wild Bill does to us a lot. Actually, is he takes mm-hmm. um, he takes characters who like w- we see them do something terrible, and we're like that's bad, which is you know a normal correct human reaction. Yeah. And then he takes them and he shows like, look, this like this isn't to excuse them, 
But this is who they are and this is what their life has been like. And these are the circumstances that led to them making that choice. And that doesn't mean you have to forgive them. Um, yeah. No. But yeah. but what that does do is it forces you to be like, well, I can see how that came about. Mm-hmm. And I can see how maybe even if I were put in that sequence of, of situations, um, I would uh, – I would be the same person, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and, and it really like, that's one of the things that, um, I think, I think we'll have more opportunity to talk about it during the mailbag, but that's one of the things that sort of like, while, while those consistently taking a crowbar to your psyche in, in sort of the same pattern over and over until you're finally just like, all right, I get it. People yeah. are complicated. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like I can't, like I can't be that mad about anything anymore after, yeah. after Ward has, has kind of had its way with me, you know? Well, I mean, I think that's what, you know, at the start of this whole thing, you mentioned that this book has changed you for the better. And I think mm-hmm. that's what you were referring to, right? Yeah. This, yeah, this general idea that like every time, every interaction I have with a human being in, in my life now, I am running it through this ward filter, right? Yeah. Where I'm like, where I'm like, okay, but what's going on in this person's life? Like what, what is it? Cause everyone is going through something. That's, that's the, like, I think the reason this book works so well is because it's, it's, it's a superhero story about trauma that is somehow universal. Like that everyone has hurt people and everyone has been hurt by people. Everyone. Now, many of us, fortunately, not nearly as much as some of the characters in the story are hurt. Thank God. Thank God. But a lot of people are for sure. And and I think like that is a thing in which we can all relate to. We, we none of us have superpowers. Well, I think most of us, don't, I, some of you out there might have superpowers, but none of us have superpowers. But this is something we relate to. And I think this is something that that we can all take away from the story, that everyone's going through their own shit and it doesn't excuse their actions. It never excuses their actions, but it can help you understand them. And, and understanding someone's actions changes how you react to them. It just does. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think I think that's it's it's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, it's it's great. I, I think I think that I think that worm also did this but i feel like war did it in a more pointed way where Mm -hmm. you know you're you're taking like there were whole arcs where you know every like for example there was an arc where like every interlude character in that arc was was like a specific character who we had uh, as a as a fandom been like well they're awful and we hate them (laughs) and then wild Bo takes them he he doesn't make us like them Mm -hmm. but he shows like this is this is what it's like to be them. Sure. And that sure. just gives you uh, just the, the necessary perspective to be like, yeah, I mean, I get it. You know, they're human. So yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it, it's super effective. Yeah. I mean, and, and I, I do, I do agree that worm did it too. Um, I think, I think it is something that occurs in worm. I think it is the point of ward or one of the points of ward. I, I think it is much more the focus of the, the themes of the story in ward. Um, and, and that's why I think it's so much, that's my reaction to it was so much stronger in this book, in mm-hmm. this book, because I mean, at the end of the day, like what I, what I, what I secretly love about, this book is I think it makes worm even better in my, my my eyes retroactively because I think, I think one of the things I struggle with at the end of worm, which is a book that I really, really liked, obviously uh, you, you, everyone knows that um, was I, I couldn't quite square in my head the idea of we won, we did it, but also Taylor was destroyed. And, and, and what this actually does to me in the end is, is, Taylor was destroyed and we won this day, but we didn't win all the days. It, we didn't stop the cycle, right? That, mm-hmm. That's basically what this book said is we didn't stop the cycle. We didn't fix everything. Th- this is not the ending that, yay, we did it. Everything we won. Um, but also Taylor was destroyed. This is yay. We did it. We won today, but we didn't solve anything. And as we see explicitly, we're repeating all the same mistakes over again. We're mm-hmm. doing it all over again. And, um, and I think that this, that being the case, this being the truth of this world of the setting of this story makes me, makes me able to square the ending of worm in my head a lot better and makes me like it a lot better. Hmm. I like that. Yeah. I never really thought about it that way. Um, I, it's interesting. I, I, I'd have to reflect a bit to, to 
really articulate this, but I, th- I think my my response to the end of Worm has actually changed over time. Um, it's a lot more complex now than than I think it it was at first. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, yeah, I, I get what you're saying about this ending feeling. Like it just feels more um, like adult, if that makes sense. I, I don't like. I think yeah, I, I think I mentioned before maybe in context of this show, maybe in context of one of our book club episodes, like when I was a kid, I would read, I would, I, I, I read a ton. I've always read a huge amount. Um, and I'd read a lot of books and I'd be like, well, adults, adults are adults. So they know everything. They, they, they've got their lives together universally. All adults have got their lives together. They figured it out. And so any book written by an adult is going to basically sort of contain the secrets for how to like, conduct yourself as a mature person and how to grow up and how to think correctly and soberly. And I mean, everyone should be, should be laughing at this point because none of that is true. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, if you are a kid sort of trying to way find how to be, how to grow up from fictional characters in 95% of books, you're going to crash your bike into a telephone pole a whole bunch of times. (laughs) Um, and the thing is, I think parahumans is actually that though. Not that the characters are doing like, like are are being good examples all the time, but that that like the underlying psychology of the characters and the sorts of 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 reactions they you know Victoria specifically ultimately have and the types of journeys they ultimately have. These are, I think, in microcosm, the journeys of you know maybe for Taylor growing up, maybe for Victoria really becoming a full adult. Yeah, no, I, no, I, I like that a lot. I, I really do. That's a great way of putting it. Um, and and that, that makes sense. That makes so, that makes a lot of sense. Like it's 10 years later, like the author is older, like the author is more of an adult. Um, and so he's going to write a character that, that kind of ends in this, this adulthood. Um, man, I like that. I like that a lot. Wildbo just said Taylor was dead in in the chat. That's what yeah. that's what's going on in the chat. Yeah, Matt. he jokes about that a lot. No, anyway. I, I, it's weird because I don't. I, this time I don't think he was joking. Like there was no like smiley emoji. Um, I think it was like a hundred percent serious. Yeah, I mean his trolling is really next level though. I mean anyway, let's move on. <laughs> um, do you have anything else you want to talk about before we move to to the mailbag? I mean. I kind of have to say no because again, two million word story. Um, Sure. Sure. um, I, 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 I'm not joking that I haven't like acknowledged that this is over. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's move on to the mailbag and maybe we can work through the rest of our, our issues there. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to get to talk a lot more about the story through the answers to those questions. So let's do it. So we're going to answer our questions um, that were sent in to us first. And then uh, if we're if we're good on time, we'll start answering some questions from the chat. Cool. So All right. you want to start, you wanna start yeah. us off? All right. So um, from No Goodbye, the question is, after going through Ward in its entirety, has it in any way changed how you think of Worm or just specific things in Worm? Oh, nuts. I just answered that question. Yeah, we, kind of, we kind of talked about that. <laughs> I mean, talk about very specific things. Like I feel like Tattletail is much you know much a much more multi-dimensional character than she was in my head at the end of worm of, of worm you know she's she's reeling from things that happened in that story and sort of maybe trying to make up for mistakes that she made in that story and uh i, mm-hmm. I like i like her a lot more and and i think she's much more interesting now that's yeah. just one specific thing to pull out sure sure yeah and i i uh changed I actually realized that I was being totally unfair to Taylor like the entire time. <laughs> and I was, I was, I apologize for everybody. Um, and, and th- there we go. That's what I learned. So word <laughs> word changed me. I was wrong. <laughs> you can't just say that, Scott. You're All right, moving seriously. on. <laughs> All right. We have a Bavarian barbarian next, which is, oh, that's a wonderful name. It's wonderful. Uh, they ask, who is your favorite non breakthrough character and why is it Ratcatcher? Is it, is it Ratcatcher, Matt? Uh, non breakthrough character. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely cradle. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, you know, that, that, that's the crazy thing is there's so many great characters in this story that I'm just like flipping through them 
in my head and sure. completely failing to come up with like a a favorite. I mean, I think I if, if we have to say non breakthrough, I would probably say like, okay, well, what was my favorite interlude and or or so I would probably either say Tattletale just because she's so prominent, or if we're going for like a more minor character, I'd say Dauntless. Okay, Dauntless is man. I went back and read that interlude after uh, the question we got. The answer to our question last week of what was your favorite part in, in Ward and someone said the Dauntless interlude and I, mm-hmm. I went back and read it and man, that's some good shit, man. Yeah. Holy crap. That's good. Yeah. Uh, my answer is going to be Love Lost, who is a character that I adore. Um, and I, you know what? We did not see Love Lost in the epilogue, right? True. I don't think we did. Um, we we did not see that. See it. See any what was happening with her. But I kind of. I kind of like that because I like that I can just kind of in my head build out what love lost is going to look like um, at the end of the story. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I think, I think she has come to a place of acceptance and, and, and come to a place where she's going to move forward. Um, I think her big, like, I love that she, she like was there with everyone at the end was doing the work um, and like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with her from now on. I don't I don't know what's going to happen with her, but I, I I have faith. I have trust that she's going to be OK. And and I love that this is like like this is a plot line that went on largely in the background of this sprawling narrative. And yet it was so satisfying even in the, the background. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like that. I mean, I think I think it's it's interesting. You you picked kind of one of the like villainous but redeemed characters. I picked a guy who's just sort of straightforwardly great, but I could have very well <laughs> picked. I could have very well picked. I mean, I, I love the I love the, the you know, the dark tinged characters. You know? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I, there, there was a moment in this book where I really thought Love Lost has gone too far, like mm-hmm. when she allied herself with the Cradle stuff. And 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 I love that, like, it turns out that she was being manipulated by Cradle into becoming more heartless. And 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 like like we've said in this these books. Uh, like constantly today just because there's an excuse for why you're behaving that way doesn't excuse the behavior. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's very clear with love lost. And I don't know. I, I think I, I, I like cops too. Like I like cop characters sue me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, like, I, like I'm, I'm really into noir stuff and she was like pushing up against that line a few times. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. She's great. She's great. Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, I, I agree. She's great. I don't think you and I are ever going to be like, no, nah, I hated that character that you like. Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, sure. okay. Uh, next question. Son of Stannis asks, who do you think is a better parent, Carol or Danny? Oh gosh. Would, would Taylor and Victoria <laughs> have done better or worse if raised by one another's parent? Oh gosh. <laughs> this is an impossible question. Um, um, I, I mean like Danny's only like mistake was not handling his wife's tragic death very well. Mm. And, and like, and and then he proceeded to, to sort of not really know how to react to Taylor's um, behavior. But but it's like even sitting here with years of distance at, at, at you know at, at a great remove, I'm like, I don't know what he what he would have done that would have actually kept her from running away, for example. Sure, sure. Um, and. Like I know, I, I know he probably should have tried something different than what he tried, which was basically nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I feel like Taylor is Taylor. Like, like we know her. <laughs> we, mm-hmm. we we know how she's going to react to yeah. an authority figure telling her that you come you come right here, young lady. You know that's that's, that's not going to fly. So yeah. like Carol, on the other hand, is um, just a whole rat's nest of 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 stuff going on there. Um, just just a disaster like i find i actually find this fairly easy i think i think carol like danny made some mistakes and probably could use some parenting advice but carol needs like a tremendous amount of therapy on top of like a whole a whole like overhaul of her parenting approach before she could be a functional parent yeah no i I agree with that i think uh, carol is not a parent she's a, a a team leader and mm-hmm. she excelled in raising Victoria in the ways in which she made her better at a better functional member of the team, but not she's a dance mom, right? Like that's she's a dance mom and she's going to make her good at really good at dancing mm-hmm. and that and and nothing else. Yeah. Um, 
Danny made, and, and I don't like, I don't want to let Danny off the hook because I do, I do agree he made mistakes, but he's a guy suffering with something and not dealing with it. Um, and she's, he's just like, I feel bad. I, I, I feel bad for both of them. I feel more bad for Danny because I think you're right. The Taylor's just as a person, like he was just not equipped to, to handle her at, at all, mm-hmm. at all. It's, it's um, more like, <clears throat> it's more like, um, the the point at which she was like talking about running away or, or like on the verge of running away, the time to have done something was like a year ago, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. if if your kid is talking about running away, your reaction in that moment is not the problem. Your reaction in all of the moments leading up to that were the problem. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I, I think the second half of this question is really interesting. Would Taylor or Victoria have done better or worse if raised by the other's parent? Um, would Taylor have been better raised by Carol, <laughs> Matt? <laughs> um, would Taylor, no, <laughs> no. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, and w- would Victoria have been better raised by Danny? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, she wouldn't have had the specific Carol caused issues. By the way, I think that was one of my favorite things about this story was how, um. Victoria was was very much aware of all all of her wretch associated issues for the first part of the book and was very blind to her Carol associated issues. Mm -hmm. And it was very fun to watch her realize or, or, you know, uncover and and grapple with those more and more as the story. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. The ways in which the Carol parts of her make her so effective at certain things. But yeah, are are compounding issues and other things. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it's great. Yep. Oh man. Um, yeah, I think both bad, bad. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't like, I don't know. Victoria, Victoria with Danny. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think probably better a, a little bit. I, I mean, like it's hard to be worse. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Elliot and Chad is saying swapping parents would result in such a fundamentally different people. that They wouldn't be the same character. So it's hard to say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so much of so much of Victoria is because of Carol. So, um, yeah, they, and we're not and we're talking outside of powers, like independent of powers. Yeah. Like, and uh, David in chat asked um, if there's anything that I'd like try to avoid doing because of the things in this book. And it, like, that's such a good question that I had to repeat it. Uh, but parenting wise specifically, like any, anything, mm-hmm. any, any changing in my parenting that, that this book has caused. Um, and, and I want to say like, yes, but it's hard for me to nail down exactly what it is. I think it's more like an appreciation for the significance of little moments, mm-hmm. which, which really it it's the book the book makes the point of like yeah like a like one moment one really bad moment can can derail your life right and the thing is when you remember your own childhood you remember very small things that your like one parent may have said that that still echo in your mind 30 years later and it's like yeah i, I try I, i'm not saying i'm successful at it but i try to be more uh uh careful i think um yeah. about about like um how I express myself and, and, and I actually try to like go out of my way to help them express themselves because I think it's actually pretty destructive for a kid to, to bottle something up that they should just say to you, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that a lot. I mean, I don't have kids, so I can't relate to this at all, but I feel like, I feel like one of the things that I'm going to be very conscious of if the day comes that I do have kids is the way in which my personal issues are, um, passed on <laughs> mm-hmm. and in bud they bud into my kid and the ways in which i'm going to try not to try not to let that happen yeah and i mean honestly you're going to slip up but um sure but sure. i think i think it's your your attitude that, that matters your approach your well obviously your 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 actions matter yes mm-hmm. yes but yes but you your your heart i think if your heart's in the right place that'll help mm-hmm Cool. All right. Sarah Penguin asks, what was the most unexpected thing in both Ward and in the podcast? What was the most unexpected thing in Ward, Matt? Um, I just think the whole the whole direction of the story was just not something that I saw coming. Like I, I was very much expecting Worm 2 in the sense of like, all right, we're going to have um, we're going to have a, a sort of traditionally set up narrative where we've got an underdog protagonist fighting against some kind of 
new evil. You know, like maybe it's going to be warlords. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it's going to be, um, you know, obviously we're going to probably involve like the big setting threats, like the shards in some way, but, but like, I just did not, I did not anticipate kind of the thematic richness driving the complexity of the plot in, in the directions that it did where, you know, a lot of the antagonists in Ward are trying to help, right? Teacher's trying to help. March is trying to help, you know, in, in his own, in his own way. Right. Sure. I mean, I mean, he thinks he is, is the point. Yes. Yes. Um, they're not, they're not just like, I, I'm, I'm bad guy. Right. I mean, it's, it's frankly, I should have known better because Cauldron was also trying to help. Uh-huh. Um, but um, yeah, I think just kind of the whole direction of what the, of like what the story was, it was just not at all what I thought it was going to be. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. I'm trying to think of like a specific instance where the book just I mean, I guess yours would be that that Byron was not a bad guy because you were all <laughs> chocolate all over him. I'm still not um, totally convinced. I I think I think there's a question coming up that um, I'm going to probably have to give the same answer again. But I think one of the things that like hurt my read of this book as much as it did was my inability to see the wretch as a positive and not a thing I should be creeped out about. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I I was like, even there near the end, even post, uh, you know, cradle of love moment or, or whatever the vow, whatever the The crater of love, I believe the crater of love. Yeah. Um, I, I, even after that moment, I was still kind of like, I'm a little worried about what this means. And I think I was kind of getting in my own way um, in that regard about like, oh, this is going to be like, like something's going to happen where this is going to take control. And, um, and and I'm not saying that that fragile one is not creepy, as people are saying. Yeah, I mean, like the moment when the moment when she holds up the, the bloodied piece of cloth to like go, shh, that's creepy as fuck. And it's supposed to be for sure. But I, I do think like I, I couldn't get out of my own way sometimes in like just letting like letting myself experience the joys of Victoria bonding with this thing. Cause I was always in the back of my mind go, uh Oh, what does that mean? Is that mean that like I, we talked for long about how she's like, she's bonding with her wretch and, and separating herself from the rest of her, the rest of the humans and how that might be a bad thing. Um, and I kind of think the book wants you to do that a little bit. Like, I think it's playing with you in that regard, but I, I feel like I just couldn't get out of my own way at times. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I wouldn't feel too bad. I think part of that is a, is a artifact of the way you and I specifically went through this where sure. like when, like, like I read, I read twig in a very much like I was reading it week to week and I would read the chapter and then I would like maybe go check the thread and chat about it a little bit, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't, talk about it for two hours and I wouldn't mm. uh I wouldn't have to write it I wouldn't have to write down my thoughts about it in, in detail and sure. and, I, and and nobody would make fun of me if I was wrong about something <laughs> mm-hmm. so so I think you and I are very much incentivized to sort of like uh go 12 dimensional chess on everything even if sure. it was just supposed to be taken in a straightforward way sure sure that's fair that's so that's fair. I'm just making excuses basically yeah. is what I'm doing right now <laughs> so what was the most unexpected thing about the podcast Matt, can you think of anything? I, I'm um, having trouble with this one. Unexpected. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, yeah, no, I, I that, that's, that's a, that's a weird thing to process because I, I don't remember exactly what things were like toward the end of, um, of we've got worm. Yeah. No, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Sorry. That I mean, was, no, that was not to, audio. not to dig up, not to dig up past like controversial things, but I, I think I was most unexpected by the visceral reaction to our discussion of the Tristan and Byron chapters. Um, yeah, sure. Um, and, and, and I'm not <laughs> saying it, I'm not saying that to say like I was right and you were wrong. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is I tried to do a very specific thing in my, the lens in which I analyze those chapters and I just I, I was proud of looking at it from a, I, what I thought was a different angle than what most people would. And I was just not expecting um, to upset as many people as I did. And I like I've already apologized for that. Like it, it certainly taught me a lot <laughs> about um, the way your words can affect people. Um, but it was I, I remember like I was on vacation like at, when that episode came out, I was up in Colorado with you. Uh-huh. And I just remember like comments 
pouring in. I mean, you're like, oh, I fucked up. I, I fucked up. What did I do? Um, so that was surprising to me. I was not, I did not go, I did not exit that episode going, oh, this is going to be a controversial one. I went, oh, this is fine. Um, and obviously, so learned something about uh-huh. myself for sure. Yeah. It's also funny because sometimes you and I will be like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the response is going to be to this particular thing. And then just, mm-hmm. it's nothing. So sure. sure. Um, yeah. All right. Um, Extas Nouveau asks, if Ruben and Elliot take on Pale, are there any chances that you will uh, deep dive into Twig? Um, we're going to answer that question at the end of the show. Um, can we can we say short answer? No. Yeah, I think but, that's fair. But maybe. <laughs> but 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 no. But like if if ever, not soon, I think is yes. probably the the like totally honest way of answering it um yeah because we tr- i mean just to be totally transparent like we've been running kingslingers our stephen king the dark tower podcast concurrently with we've got ward and it it has been it has been too much um that mm-hmm. was too much to take on it was it, definitely too much it is too to much to do on. two of this type of show at the same time in addition to the doof cast in addition to the book club too much um and so no we're not going to be doing twig as long as we're doing some other big project. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the answer to that. However, we do have stuff to talk about at the end of the show. We do. So, so stay stay tuned. tuned. Yeah. All right. Um, let's go next to Rid Tom who says, if you could pick three moments from the story that encapsulates Victoria's journey, what would they be and why? Um, Oh my God, that's a hard question. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I mean like the first and most obvious would be at the, uh, at the, at the community center where she's pushed out of the stasis that she's been in. Um, and basically the plot starts. Mm -hmm. That's the inciting incident for sure. It's the inciting incident. And I would call the last moment that encapsulates her journey. Um, the moment where she, she really kind of finds peace and catharsis with, with the wretch, with her force field, with her shard. Um, Mm -hmm. The thing is, though, all of these moments are like tied to other things, right? Like that 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 moment in the Crater of Love only landed because of fifteen other things that had that had been set up such that you were ready for it. Um, it mm-hmm. You know, not anticipating it, but prepared for it in, in a sense. So I got yeah. the, I got the two end members, and now I just have to think about like I think my third pick would be fuck that. That that felt like a big deal, and th- that that that's yeah. very close to the f- yeah. to the start of the story, also. So I might even I might even say like maybe that would be my inciting incident because for her, she kind of got pulled into uh, the community center deal, whereas that was her um, self motivating herself to to jump yeah. on something. Yeah, and I wonder I wonder where I, I feel like Victoria's choice to ignore dauntless or not dauntless to ignore defiant and go into the shard world seems like it belongs on this list somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't, I just don't like, I don't know where, like, obviously I, I agree with you that the last beat of this three beat that red Tom is asking us to set up here is, uh, it, it in the, the crater of love mm-hmm. that, that seems like that seems like the most obvious one. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a bunch of other moments out there that I could think of though. Like I agree with you that the first fuck that moment is this watershed moment. Um, I think I, I'm trying like, the, like I, I'm trying to think of moments in which not just stuff happens to Victoria, but in which Victoria makes choices based off stuff happening to her. Yeah. I feel like her choice to, um, to help Sveta get a body feels like a watershed moment. Like I, it feels mm-hmm. like an important moment in her journey. Um, where she's just, she's just exhausted by no long-term solutions. Um, yeah. I mean, so, um, sorry. Uh, I, I, it, my eyes just skipped off of the the name of the person suggesting it, and so I'm going to have to say it without attribution, which is bad. That's okay. That's okay. Um, um, uh, somebody suggested the moment with Amy in the prison. It was Dan. Mm-hmm. Dan suggested the moment with Amy in the prison, and and I'm like, like, sure. I mean, you could probably make a really good case for that. I I think I mean that was a big setback for her, right? Or that was something that caused a big setback for her. Uh, in terms of her sort of progress in like getting past these things, but you could also argue maybe that it catalyzed certain things. I mean, it it, it was a horrible it was a horrible thing. Um, it's interesting to consider in terms of like the the impact that that moment had on the plot. 
Um, but I, yeah, I mean, that was something where, where it, when they said that I had to consider it seriously and be like, well, yeah, I mean, I don't want to think about that, but it's certainly important to her characters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, story. Sure. 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 I, I thought about that. <clears throat> I, I agree. She, it, it, she seems like, it seems like she's less active in those moments, but, um, mm-hmm. I know what you mean. It's more how she reacts to it. Right. Yeah. Sure. 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 Yeah. Uh, they have a bonus question thematically. What was in your opinion, the turning point in her journey that prevented her from going down the path Taylor took? I, that's, that's tough because I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I, I would ever like, I don't know if that's just not who Victoria is. I don't in retrospect, I don't think that that was a path that Victoria would ever take. I, I just, I, I don't, I don't mm. think I don't think she had it in her to do that kind of thing. Maybe. Yeah. I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm finding myself, disagreeing with you more than usual. Um, okay. <laughs> just, just because there were so many points during the book where we were, we were like, uh, Titan Victoria on the horizon, you know, sure. Which, sure. which would have been very much the same thing. And I'm like, what did, what did hold her back from that? You know, what, what was the thing that kept her from falling through the cracks? Because there were so many times when we were like, she's not, she's not being honest. She's not being honest about how, <laughs> about how raw she is. She's totally going to crack. And, I, and I can't even put my finger on exactly what it was. I, 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 I'm forced to sort of fumble for something and say that it's her, her connections to her team, her connections to the people who are kind of supporting her, the connect, the, the people who she knows that she needs to be there to support. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel like those are the things that kept her from falling through the cracks, even though she was definitely having a rough time. I do think it's interesting that like it, it explicitly at the end of worm, it's Taylor's connections to people that keep her going. But like, I feel like they're just the connections Victoria has versus the connections Taylor has are treated differently, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, I, and, and I, and I agree with you that like, you know, the, the moments, the moments where Victoria says, fuck that, um, are, are, are moments where she's explicitly saying, no, I don't accept this. I don't accept that this is the solution. I don't accept that this is, this is the world we have to live in. I don't accept that these are the choices I have to make. I do not accept those. Um, and I think fuck that is, is just like, I think Taylor would say fuck that too, but mean it in a different kind of way. Um, mm-hmm. and I, I think the Vicky fuck that's are specifically saying no, um, to the, to that, that kind of path. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Cool. All right. Uh, Snape12345 says, if you two were thrown into the city at the start of Ward, as you are now, what would you do? Die. Would, would you try and help? <laughs> uh, uh, would you try to stay out of the way and survive? Would you try to start a fan club uh, cult for Victoria? I mean, obviously that last one is yes. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, I, would, uh, I, would, I would panic. I would freak out. <laughs> I, would, uh, I, would, uh, I would try to probably leave Gimmel. <laughs> and then after I was safely somewhere else, I would, uh, I would contact them and be like, look, I, I may probably have some kind of thinker power or something. Cause I know, you know, the plot of the next, <laughs> the next 20 arcs. Oh, oh, so wait, wait. So in this, in your scenario answer to this question, it's you're thrown into the city at the start of the book after having read the book. As you are now. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Okay, well, that's different. Yeah, I mean, I think the smart thing to do would be to, like, actually, I think attaching yourself as close to the 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 protagonist as possible is actually probably the best thing you can do, which is ironic. Huh. Yeah, maybe. Maybe so. All right, cool. Um, next up, we have LR Raider, who says, any chances of March Madness Season 3 covering Worm and Ward characters? In March 2021, eight rounds, 256 characters, and Scott has to come up with 250 match titles. Dear <laughs> Lord, um, no. <laughs> uh, that actually does sound pretty fun, <laughs> actually. <laughs> You're totally going to do it. He's going to do it. Fuck. You can see Fuck. it in his eyes. Uh, uh, all right. That's, that's, that's great. That made my night. (laughs) All right. Um, the cool noob says, what is one thing aspiring writers can learn from Ward to do and one thing to not do? Ooh, that's tough. That's a hard question. What? I mean, Um, I I guess just to pick one thing, I mean, I, I would, I think at the risk of repeating myself, like 
the pay attention to the way in which uh, the idea, the theme that the writer wants to be talking about and thinking about and showing you is is reflected through like every single choice about character, about setting, mm-hmm. about plot, about conflict, um, and and how much better that actually makes it. Um, sure, that would be the thing to learn because that's not something. I, that's not something I ever learned in school. Like that's something I had to learn by like reading books about writing and then, and then doing a lot of reading and noticing like, Hey, that is what, that is what good books tend to do actually. Mm-hmm. You know, um, one thing not to do. I mean, I, I, I don't have anything off the top of my head. Honestly, I, I would actually feel terrified to tell someone like what not to do. Like I, my thing, like I, I study writing as like a craft and not as like a thing that I could ever actually do. Like I could never, never, I love exploring writing as a, as a concept, as a thing that people do. I I can't do it. <laughs> like I, I can't. Um, so I, it makes me uncomfortable to like, see like, here's one thing you could learn not to do based on board um, or, or to do like it, it, it makes me incredibly nervous to even thinking about answering that. So um, I think, I think, read read a bunch that's like a cop-out answer but like i think the best writers read a bunch yeah Um, and don't use adverbs now i'm just quoting stephen king (laughs) yeah (laughs) um what was the biggest thing you learn about following along with a web serial as it's written that's from that's from elliot hi elliot um i think we talked about that a little bit already matt um yeah Um, you know, I, I think, I think Elliot may have meant this like particularly in contrast to doing what we did for, we've got worm where we were doing it all in one big, well, one series of giant chunks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I think he's probably looking, maybe, maybe looking to sneak some advice in cause he's doing this whole exact same thing. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I mean, definitely it, it was, it was very different not having the, um, person who has read it, person who has not read it kind of relationship because right, right. you, you're just, you know, you're, you're, you, you both have the same role basically. Um, mm-hmm. and that, that took some readjustment. Um, you know, yeah. just, it, it also, it was interesting because it just, you have to talk about things in a different way. We talked about, sometimes we talk about a whole arc of worm in, in two hours. Sometimes we talk about just, just half of an arc of worm in two hours. Mm-hmm. Whereas here you're talking about, two chapters. Um, and, and the thing that I learned that was maybe surprising was like, you can go infinitely deep. (laughs) Right. Um, Yeah. And, and you have to like a lot of the pre prep and, and planning is, is thinking in advance about like, all right, look, there's like, there's still there's still ten or twenty thousand words that we that we have to talk about here. It's seen you know you can say oh it's only two chapters. It's still ten ten or twenty thousand words of of tight you know the way Wildbo writes very tight intricate uh, storytelling. You have to pick the things you want to talk about and you're going to leave a lot out. Actually, I think that's what sure. surprised me. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what surprised me actually. That's what I that's what I learned was how much we still had to leave out, even though we talked about these for two hours a week. Yeah. I mean, I I think we saw comments on just about every episode that was like, I'm surprised you guys didn't talk about this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's like, I, I, me too. Me too. too. And yet look at how much we talked about. So yeah, yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I think, I I think we, we, we kind of skipped our, our self, our self critique section because we got excited about discussion questions and just jumped into them. Um, I think it's a different show, right? It's a, it's a totally different show. And I think doing chapter by chapter in this method, you kind of lose the forest a little bit, just a little bit. Um, I've, I love the work we did with, we've got worm. Um, I love the work we did here, but I, I do feel at times we lost the forest a little bit. Um, Oh yeah, that, that's, that's for sure. And I don't know, I don't even know like what I could have done differently, but I, I agree. Right. I think, I think that, especially when you kind of get into the groove, you get into the groove and you start forgetting that this is a, a, a story. <laughs> you, right. You're, you're almost just talking about that week's chapters, you know? Right. Um, yeah. I, I think that's a, that's definitely something that we did. Yeah. And, and, and like, I think like at the, at the beginning of the show, we had this idea that we would do a, 
um, like we would finish an arc and do like a retrospective of the arc as part of our, as part of the final episode of the arc. And we just kind of stopped doing that eventually, or we did it in like 30 seconds or two minutes instead of like a long time. Um, and that's, that was just like a practical, that's a, just a practical solution in that, like we just didn't have time. Like it would be like basically on your normal week where we're basically running up against the gun every second, the whole time. And then we have to also do like reread the entire arc and do like a, a whole arc examination we just didn't have time it just didn't become practical like it's it just wasn't a, a thing we could do um and and i missed like like see things talking about the way a whole arc in one episode you could look at the first chapter and see the thematic setup totally we tried to point those out when we saw them in ward but it was mostly a guess like i think this is what the theme of the arc is going to be based on this first chapter but i don't know mm-hmm. um and and that is something that like i i i do think I do think that there were times when with worm that I wish I could go way, way deeper. And I, I think we're running a podcast called Kingslingers right now. We're doing dark tower. And I do think we've got the sweet spot between the two. Mm-hmm. Um, and on that, we also take a week off after we finish every book to talk about the entire book. So like, I think we've hit the sweet spot with that. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just like following along with a story live like this. If you do that, you're behind and those episodes where we had to do like four chapters in one episode were really, really tough, really tough. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that like there are probably thousands and thousands of pages written about like Shakespeare or, mm-hmm. or, or Proust or, you know, um, any, any number of these like great literary authors. And it's like, there is actually an infinite amount that you can say about a given text if that text is, is like above a certain complexity threshold. In fact, there's probably an infinite amount you could say even if it's not that complex because uh-huh. we're all reacting to things, right? Mm-hmm. So so all you can really do is talk about what you have to say about that thing. And sometimes that thing is going to take you a certain amount of time. Sure. And, um, and you're going to miss things too. And that's sure. that's just kind of how it has to be. Like it can't be anything different than that, right? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah. Cool. Um, um, we got to go a little faster we, with these questions. We do have to go a little faster. And I think we're going to take a little pause after the next one. So, um, yeah. Uh, let's see where, where, do, 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 right. do, do, do. Uh, kitten sharktopus says, <laughs> what was the time when you realized that Ward had changed the way you think? Um, this uh, is, we, this is, this is a good one. Yeah. I think we've kind of touched on that already, but, um, I think you can I th- rehash your wonderful answer if you want to. Matt. Yeah, I can try to. Um, there, there were like particular people in my life and things in my past where I, I just had a lot of anger and blame toward toward that person, mm-hmm. and um, I don't really want to get like particular about it, but just like things things that were causing like an ongoing amount of 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 pain in my mind and suffering for me and unpleasantness in my day-to-day existence because I just, I just, I, I was so, I was so wronged and it, and it hurt me so much. And pretty soon after the Tristan Byron interludes, like, like really quite like within a, a week or two of, of us, you know, reading those and talking about them and processing them, I was just like, I'm just going to decide that I forgive this person. Mm-hmm. And I just made that decision. And like the moment that it happened, the moment that I made the decision, it wasn't magic. I didn't magically instantly feel better because of course not. But over the subsequent, you know, relatively short period of time, I just, every time an issue would come up or I would find myself making myself miserable with a certain pattern of thoughts, I would just be like, no, we, we decided, we decided to forgive them. We decided to forgive them. We're not doing that anymore. And within a, within a pretty short time frame. I was just done with it and I'm, and I'm done with it now. And I actually have a, a great relationship with this person now on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. No. So, um, um, a huge, huge, huge positive impact in my life. I can't even characterize what a big difference this has made for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I will always remember that as like the most impactful thing from this book and like maybe maybe from any book i don't know that's hard to prove um yeah yeah huge huge life changer for me yeah yeah no i i i 
absolutely adore that answer. And I'm, I'm going to say some stuff and there's no way it can be as beautiful or impactful as that ever. Um, but that's, that's, that's wonderful. And that makes me really happy. Like I'm, I'm so, I'm so absolutely happy for you because that's, that's such a big deal. Um, and I love that it was, it was fiction. It was narrative. It was stories that got you there because I think that's, we talk so much about the power of storytelling, um, and what a good book can do. Mm -hmm. And, and I think this is, this is proof positive right here. Um, yeah. And I agree with you. I think like to my, my take on this kind of similar concept is like, I, I am a person who like, who like needs people to like me. <laughs> like I really, I really want people to like me a lot. Um, which, Hey, uh, doing stuff on the internet, maybe not like the best, the best choice. Uh, if you have that particular, that particular thing. Um, and I think a lot of the story, you know, like th there were, there were a lot of moments throughout this, this, this podcast where, um, there's some people out there that don't like me very much. And, and, that's fine. Like, I, I don't, I like, I, I would say I don't care. Obviously I do. The, my whole point right now is that I care, but I think like one of the things that the, that the, the themes of the story helped me do was get to a point where like, okay, this person that is upset with me, this person that doesn't like me, this person that has something out for me, um, they got some stuff going on. And, and I, I mean, in, in relation to this podcast, but I also mean in my life, people I deal with at my day job, people I deal with, uh, with, with my family, with, with friends, um, with people from my past, all that stuff. And, um, I, I, I would really, really get upset if a person was mad at me, if a person didn't like me or, or all these things. And I've learned to just be like, to, to be able to reframe that as not a reflection on me, but a like reflection on them. Um, and I, I, I find that, I find that wonderful. Um, and, and like, that's been really powerful for me because I still, I still need people to like me <laughs> and thank you everyone in chat who's saying you, I'm not, I, that was, I swear to God, that was not me fishing for compliments. <laughs> um, I still have that problem and I'm still working through that problem, but I, I, I think I let it affect me less when, when they don't or when people are mad at me or like like sometimes in, in my personal life like I acquiesce to things because I need someone to like me so much and and I think the book has like I think the book has let me be okay with with people's reactions to things in ways you know you know what I mean do you know yeah. what I mean yeah no I, I do I do absolutely I think I think that that is one of the things that the book like we, we were talking about this idea that that it kind of allows you to see um to, to see other people's lived experience from the inside and yeah, yeah. um it 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 sort of allows you to see, to 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 use that tool um in this particular kind of scenario that you're describing mm -hmm. i think it also helps you see yourself from the outside interestingly yeah yeah, yeah which yeah. which helps with that exact same thing because you're like uh, yeah i i can see how that could have come off that way you know um okay yeah. we we need to um take a short break from the questions um if you'll give me a moment. Yeah, we're, we're having um, a special, a special, a couple special guests come on uh, to talk about something and then we'll go back to the questions. Um, Scott, please fill time. Uh, hey, everybody. Let's see what people are saying in chat. They're saying nice things to me. This is all very nice. I, I love this. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> We've got uh, some guests, Scott. Hello, guests. Hello. Oh, you're a little loud, Matthias. Oh dear. <laughs> I I apologize. That's all right. That's all right. Um so to explain what's going on here folks, uh we have Matthias and Clarence here um to kind of, we've we've kind of temporarily moved on to the what comes next section of of our show. We're going to move back to the discussion question, but we didn't want these these folks hanging out here um waiting for us to because we're taking far far too long. You surprised um, us. I, I told Elliot to to give me a heads up and then you uh we surprised him. So well, we gotta we okay. gotta we gotta we gotta <laughs> if we get a schedule Matthias. So Matthias, Clarence, could you introduce yourself to our people watching at home? Um and then we'll kind of talk about what you're gonna be doing soon. Yeah. Um so I'm Matthias. I'm a host on Do the Right Thing. Um, and I've read Worm at least four-ish times. Uh, and my co-host is Clarence. He is a literary expert. I honestly, he's um, probably the best poet I know. 
um, uh, and in an English major, I know a lot of poets. So what is this? Um, he's really good at this stuff. So, someone actually trained in this stuff. Wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so that's that's what we're here for. We're uh, announcing uh, we are. Um, it's not an official reboot, but like you could call it a reboot. We're rebooting. We've got worm. So <laughs> no, you're we'll not. Be, um, no, you're not. We're not rebooting. Well, we're, we're doing a new take on um, the We've Got Warm formula. We'll be going through uh, Wild Bo's first pair human uh, classic and uh, this time doing it in a different way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's going to be called uh, Decomposing Worm. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, we, we made several hints throughout the course of the last few shows that um, – we are that while Matt and I are done in the Wild Bow universe for a little while, that does not mean that Doof Media is. And I think one of those is the way you come in here, the way that you both of you come in. Um, and so t- do you, you've you've kind of called it similar, but but different. So wh- how 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 is it going to be a little bit yeah. different than than the We've Got Worm formula? You want to feel that one, Clarence? Yeah. OK, so we um, we're kind of doing it in like these two different parts um, where we'll basically be giving a lot of like um, kind of experimental, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. literary perspectives, kind of analyzing um, different themes throughout um, in in just a lot of different like ways, I guess, and kind of considering different concepts. Yeah. So uh, basically um, we split the book into six ish, uh, really huge chunks and um, we'll be uh, doing two episodes on each chunk. The first one is arcs one through eight, it, a pretty classic cutoff point. Um, the first uh, part is the overview. So we'll be going through it in a pretty normal, we've got ward um, sense where we'll go through the most important beats arc by arc, not chapter by chapter this time. Um, and ending with, uh, of course, Clarence's first time reader speculations and theories and things like that. Uh, but the second part is where we'll be um, doing a lot of different things. Uh, we have planned um, character um, character studies in the first part. And then as well as basically uh, whatever random essay we decide to write on that particular book. Um, so those are going to be pretty free ranging. Um, and then, of course, we want to hear from um, you guys on your favorite like themes and theories and uh, just kind of the non-obvious textual um, thesis that you could take from it. Um, like get get weird with your analysis of word of, of warm, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's really cool because I think Matt and I generally are like functionalists when it comes to criticism, like that's the the lens in which we look at, at stories from. Um, and I, I am very excited with the idea that, that the both of you are going to go into this thing and try to look at it from some different lenses and, and see what, what else there is to be mined there. Because I think it's one thing that this network and, and these shows have shown us that there's always, there's always more to find there. There's always more stuff you can look at. There's always a different angle, a different lens you can take on, on something and, and find something about, writing about storytelling about um the world and i'm i'm really excited to revisit the story with y'all i have not read it at all since we finished ours and i don't remember anything that happens in worm i've totally forgotten so um i'm very excited (laughs) yeah me too i mean i i look forward to just like learning stuff about uh you know these different critical lenses that that you're planning to apply and um learning more about worm too because i'm sure there's stuff in there that i don't notice because I'm me and I don't have the tools, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. This is awesome. Yeah. So when, when is this, when is this, when is this happening? So, um, as, as soon as this ends, I'll finish, uh, typing up the Reddit post where you guys, uh, can put your questions for Clarence and your themes and theories. Um, cause I was halfway through that. <laughs> what do you guys call me? <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. Um, and uh, basically the announcement episode, so when you can start uh, subscribing to the feed, will be out in like three-ish days as soon as iTunes approves it. Um, the first real episode will come out next Friday. So um, basically immediately we'll be recording, I think, next Monday. So that's when we need all the questions and things by. Um, and uh, after that, we'll be releasing weekly going 
um, alternatively, the overview episode and then the perspectives episode, which is with the fun uh, essays and other things, and then going to the next book with the next overview. All right. Well, that's very exciting. I, I am so excited for you. Clarence, I'm so excited for you to get to experience this this story because it's it's wonderful. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> It's it's been so exciting. Uh, I I mean, everyone who's uh, successfully uh, wormed someone else <laughs> knows the joy. <clears throat> the joy uh, yeah, of is. of hearing anyone's perspective on uh, the story, and it's just been it, it's been fantastic to uh, hear Clarence's takes. It, it can't be that can't be the phrase, right? We, it can't be going. <laughs> yeah, with... no, it's, that's the canonical phrase. <laughs> I'm okay, okay. establishing it. Yeah, well, better one. No, I mean, no, but we'll take it. <laughs> Court accepted, you know. But that's oh wait, that's a fungus. No, that doesn't yeah. work. Never mind. Cancel. Belay that. Um, no, this this is this is great. So excited. Um, and I don't have to do anything. I just get to listen to somebody else talk yeah. about Worm, which it's is super great. great. Um, but yes, uh, you know, we like we like Worm, and we're sure you will too, Clarence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he yeah. I, I mean, it, I love I what I've read so far. Awesome. Yeah, I'm very already taken with all the characters. Wonderful, wonderful, yes. awesome, great. Well, um, I I can't wait to listen to that. Uh, thank you guys for hopping on real quick. I really appreciate that. Um, we're gonna get back to answering some questions, but I can see by the chat right here that uh, everyone is very excited. So so okay, that's well, perfect. Uh, go to Reddit in like ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> great, great, great. All right. All right. Ten minutes. Well, if you met us, Matthias, it'll be an hour. No, no. He he's gonna be working while we're talking. Man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. You guys have a good rest of your cast. You too. Thanks for having Thanks. us on. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank Bye. You, you too is what I just said. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, hey, let's uh let's get back to some questions, huh? Yeah. Manuos says you have hinted in the previous mailbag and in one more episode since about reservations about film movie slash anime wink wink adaptations of parahumans. Why is that? Um, it's cause I just don't think that it would be good. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I don't think this is even my original thought to just say like so much of what makes these stories, what they are is the internality of the characters. Like, like they're like, you just cannot, like if you just show what what Taylor is doing, she looks totally insane, right? Like like th- that, that like they even make a point of this in in the book where it's like she finally gets a, a glimpse of what she looks like and she's like, oh my god. Mm-hmm. Um, so like like and 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 really Victoria similar but different where so much of her story is these intricate complex psychological shifts that are that are being portrayed through her thoughts and feelings over time. Like you, you can't, I, I don't know if you can convey that visually. You can convey certain things visually. You you can certainly convey a lot of emotionality visually um, and through dialogue, but I don't think, I, I just don't think it would connect. Yeah. I mean, he, here's my, I, I certainly think I, I really don't. I think there's very few things in the world that are unadaptable that are truly unadaptable. This might be one of them, but I, I don't know if I'm that comfortable with it. Um, I think it's possible to adapt this well. I do. I don't think it would ever happen that way. Like, I just don't, I just don't think so. Um, and like my only desire for there to be an ad- adaptation is that it would bring new people to the story. And that, that would be like, if, if that's what's necessary to get more people to the story, a hundred percent I'm behind an adaptation I'll, and I will be there opening day or sitting on my couch opening day, depending on where it is. Um, but I just, I just, I just don't think anyone could do it. Like, I just think it's, it's, it's really hard. And like the, 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 it's like the edge, you're on the edge of a knife in, in doing it. And I just, I don't know. I just don't have yeah. a lot of faith in like people are flawed and people make mistakes. <laughs> and when you have a complex budget and so much money and the amount of money that's going to need to be involved and the amount of people that are going to be involved because of that much money is involved. I just don't have a lot of faith in it being Mm -hmm. executed, uh, in a way that, that works. Yeah. I, I I would, I, I would be like way more into like, 
a mini series. Uh, maybe that's even the wrong word. Forget that. Just just like a, a, a an adaptation of the Slaughterhouse Nine arc. You know, an adaptation of um. I'm I'm that's that's unfortunately the best example I could think of. Just because, um, one it kind of has its own whole thing going on, and right, right. Like, like like and even then you would still have to be like we're not going to focus too much on the travelers because this isn't pair we're not doing pair humans mm-hmm. and so you don't need to weave in all of these details about the travelers you you actually want to pair things away right so the only way to do a successful adaptation is to pair things away and hopefully you've paired away the right things right so I- any adaptation is going to involve uh, simplification and that's like one of the things we love about this story is its complexity and its richness. So sure, sure. So that's the you know. Oh my God! I can't believe they left out Sundancer. You know, of, <laughs> cor- of course they're going to leave out Sundancer. They don't have time for that. You know, right, in, in, right. in any kind of visual medium. So yeah. yeah, Chad is talking about. We have Ed and Chad talking about what about visual medium set in Parahumans universe, but not these stories. Yeah, I, I, that I think I think to me that's the way forward. Right, like take the concepts of this world and tell stories in it. I think is is um is the is what we can do here. And I think that would work because I think the world is rich and interesting. Um the, there is a lot of interesting dynamics that can be mined that would be cool in a TV show or a movie or something like that. I do think that's the way forward. Mm-hmm. But these stories, Worm as a story, Ward as a story, no, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Cool. Cool. Um, Zoltron one, two, three says, apologies, this isn't a ward question, but are you guys planning to do another Weaver dice session? Um, uh, and then they say, what do you, what plans do you have for future podcasts? Uh, do you want a short answer to that? I mean, we're going to, we, we have a whole section coming up about what's next. Yeah. Short but, answer. I mean, I, do we want to save it or <laughs> Yeah, let's just save it. Let's just, let's save, just it. save it. Yeah, we're going to save um, it. Thank you for your questions, Zoltron. We we will yeah. get back to this. Yeah. Yes, we yeah. will absolutely get back to this. Yeah. Uh, next, we have Ibarra Watt um, that asks, do you read Parahumans fan fiction? What kind of concepts would you want to explore with it? No, I don't. Nope, I, really. I don't think either of us have read any fan fiction, um, right? <laughs> no, 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 I haven't. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that I've really read that would qualify as fan fiction would be the Harry Potter and the methods of rationality. Um, I just, um, honestly, honestly, like in the last two to three to four ish years, I am so reliant on audiobooks to consume the things that I want to read that I just don't read that much text, yeah. like other than yeah. literally Ward, because this is like our job. I don't, I don't read that much text, um, which I mean, maybe my brain is starting to atrophy, but, uh, but that's just the truth. So, so, so no, that's, that's, you know, that's my, yeah. that's one reason. And another reason is that I just, I feel like there's so much out there already that, that fan fiction usually ends up lower on the list than all the other stuff that I end up right. wanting to read. I mean, between reading this book, reading the Stephen King book, we're reading, reading the book club book and reading my one or two books, I get to, to read just on my personal to be read list. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I just don't have time for a lot else. And, um, yeah, it's just, it ends up being lower priority. Um, uh, I, I think seeing, I think like, I think what we were just talking about visual medium of making a TV show or a, mo- a movie set in this universe, that would basically be the fan fiction that I would love to consume. Um, but, but I, I've never been a big fan fiction reader. I don't want to, I, I have nothing against it as a medium. I, I love that people use fan fiction as a way to, to explore worlds and to uh, hone their skill as a writer. Um, utmost respect for those people. I think a lot of very, very talented authors have come out of doing fan fiction, but it's just not something that I've ever really spent a lot of time doing. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, so it, it's not something I think about when I have time to read. I pick up a, a book that's on my, my big stack over there. Um, um, of course, Weaver Dies Vegas is a fanfic, so I guess I should. Yeah, I mean, I guess yeah. it is. We haven't yeah. read it. We, we, you made it. I guess I'm reading we, it. We, we made it. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, what is uh, from Lost Man One Three Eight? What is, was the hardest thing to read in Ward? Um, see, that's man. Like that's the thing is, there's so many options here, right? Um, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about the hospital scene with Amy where I I think I had like literal, like, like, um, 
nausea. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm thinking about like the Tristan interlude when he's got Byron trapped, and you and you're just like feeling his torment and and knowing what's going on with Byron at the same time, and just how horrible God. that is. I'm thinking what a master about, class in writing. Holy I, shit. Yep. I'm thinking about everything in in Eclipse having to do with basically every time Ashley kind of falls in a direction where you're just like, no, <laughs> please don't do that. And then she does. And you're just like, oh, this sucks. You know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. these these are all moments that just really like stab me in the heart. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think the Amy stuff, the Amy stuff made me, you know, physically sick at sometimes um, mm-hmm. that that the Amy flashback, I think, was was tops for me. Um, but I agree with you. The, the, the Tristan stuff was really hard. Um, the Kenzie dinner scene while I loved it was brutal. He was just brutal. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, so, I mean, there were a lot of, there were a lot of hard stuff. To re- I, I think the difference is like, I actually, when, when something is hard for me to read, I like it because that means it's working on me like oh, that. Yes. Like, like uh, this is why I, this is why I like horror movies. Like this is why I like I like genre fiction because it it it, it tends to affect me in a wide range of emotions. And so like like it, it didn't um it 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 was hard to read in that like oh god this is this is making me ill this is making me angry this is making me disgusted. Um, but then at the same time I'm like this is working yeah this is working. Yeah, I think that there yeah. were times in this book, there were definitely times in, in Twig where I actually had to stop and like go get a drink of water. I, I, mm-hmm. I just I had to I had to stop. And that to me is um, I wouldn't have it any other way. That's exactly mm-hmm. that's perfect. Right. Um, th- like you're like thank thank you know, thank the universe that this exists, that, that, that art this powerful exists and that I'm fortunate enough to read it. That's kind of my feeling yeah. about it. Yeah. I agree. Totally agree. Um, we, some people in chat are saying trigger event roulette. Uh, when, when we saw mm-hmm. every, we saw when everyone went to the dream, uh, what a chapter, what a chapter. Yeah. It was so good. Absolutely. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, BWU two five six says, "What prediction did you make in Ward that was the most wrong?" Matt, you want to take this one? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think everyone already knows my answer. <laughs> um. Well, I mean, yeah. So, 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 I, I think it's fun. This is something we haven't talked about in forever. But this idea that the story sets us up to be like someone on this team is is dangerous, and we should be worried about them. Yeah. And yeah. um. And then. And then some of us fixate on entirely the wrong person. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, every single person in the chat is taking this opportunity to just, to just say chocolate at me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like I'm in middle school. Oh, uh, but it's so wonderful, Matt. Look, you made a whole term that we use forever. It. It's 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 fun. Yeah, yeah. I, if, if I had to nitpick something about this book, and I don't really want to do that, but I, I do think that I lo- I love that the setup was one of these people can't be trusted. I feel like the payoff didn't leave me super satisfying on that. Like where it's mm-hmm. Chris and maybe it's not supposed to be satisfying. You're just supposed to be like, Oh, Oh, it was Chris. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just yeah. remembering it. Well, it's, it could, it could be the case that what we were supposed to take away from it was like Jessica Yamada's whole approach to being like, Hey, Hey Victoria, you know how this is your therapy group where you're supposed to be developing trust and, and deep relationships. One of them is a killer. <laughs> like that's, that was probably a bad approach because all it did was make her super paranoid, you know? Sure. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't think, I don't think anything good came of Jessica warning her. Right. Cause it's not, cause they didn't, they didn't figure out it was Chris in a way that helped. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. True, true, true. Okay. We're getting someone in chat asking to explain the chocolate. Um, so let's, let's do this, Matt. No, like, so it's good. <laughs> so one time, I think this was f- like, it was when Byron was driving Rain and Aaron back to the Fallen Camp, right? Or to, uh, like to the train, I think. Yeah, to the right? train to get back to the Fallen Camp. So early, early, early Ward, he was like eating a bar of chocolate, and well, f- he um, gave he gave Rain and Aaron a bar of chocolate or something. Yes, he he bought he bought some chocolate from the vending machine and then gave the chocolate to to Rain. Like that was it. Yeah. And and I decided that this was like super ominous. 
and I and I, I even read the scene. I read the scene where it happened, but I read it in this voice that was like meant to show how suspicious this was. <laughs> um, and uh, no, it was just Byron buying some chocolate and giving it to his friend because he's yeah. super nice. Yeah. Um, and then he handed him the chocolate. Yeah. But like, but like, it's a super good example. It's like my favorite example of me just latching on to something and just being like, I think this is, I think this means something, you know. Mm-hmm. So. Yes. The cho- yeah. chocolate is chocolate is now our reference for any time that we that we have a ridiculous theory that is, that like is even by our own admission not based in much but but would be fun if it was true. That's chocolate. <laughs> Rob has pulled the quote for us and I want you to read this now, Matt. You need to read this out loud. He crossed paths with Aaron, who was returning, accepted a chocolate bar from her and disappeared around the corner, never to be seen again. <laughs> See, 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 see. <laughs> I love it. All right. I love it. Uh, Scott, did you have any terrible predictions? I don't remember. Um, I think I'm you sure thought Tristan was going to live. I did. I did d- like defiantly say Tristan's not going to die. Yeah. So that's that was pretty rough. Yeah. He only died for a little while, though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, I tinker, therefore I am, said um, Matt said in a recent podcast that he likes to listen to the same four albums over and over. What are those albums? Um, I guess they'd just be like Anima, Lateralis, Anima, and Lateralis. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Great, Matt. That's Great. it. Yeah. Uh, Tweedle Stupido says, what character in Parahumans do you want to see again in a future Wild Bow work? Word has it he plans to write some short stories that may be set in the Wormverse, and I'm interested to see to know who you guys want to see again. Honestly, Tweedle none of no one none of them i i feel like i feel like if we see another character from this story that from this story that we know in another work it means that they're going to go through some rough times and i don't want them to go through that like I, i would i would love and read any story that comes out of this universe in the future but i would prefer it to be some new people um, I feel like we leave all our people in a place where I'm like, I'm happy with where they are. And I don't, I don't want to muck that up with more, with more pesky conflict. I mean, well, was so good at creating new characters that I'm like, I, my answer like always has to be like, I would like to see whatever the new character is because that's another mm-hmm. awesome character that I get to know. Right. Um, I, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to give the same exact pseudo cop out answer that you did. Um, <laughs> Um, (laughs) i mean like like there are certain characters that i just adore but but i I actually agree with you that i just i don't need to see more of them like this was this was their time you know Mm -hmm. yeah i I agree with you like i I wish i could like my answer to what is my favorite character is different from what character would i want to see again because i I agree i don't I would be I would be totally satisfied if the next story had nothing had none of these characters at all zero so all right cool uh next question from Watson which character on breakthrough or outside if you want do you connect to the most whose journey did you understand at the most personal level oof um, yeah um I th- I it's like I I saw this question I thought about it for a while and I just like have still not been able to come up with an answer where I'm just like, Oh yeah, definitely, uh, definitely blank. Um, yeah. You know, like I, I felt like I, I liked, I liked a lot of stuff in, in rains and I liked a lot of stuff in Tristan slash Byron's. And it's interesting. Cause like, I don't think of myself as like, Oh yes, I'm, I'm a person who's done terrible things and is struggling with guilt. Like, like I don't connect to them on that level level but i i for, for some reason i empathize with them a lot does that yeah. make sense at all no it does it does and, and that's kind of where i'm at too like i um i'm very like it, it actually to, to to go through my thought process here it makes me very uncomfortable to answer this question because i feel like by saying i understand or relate to one of these characters i'm like saying that i've gone through something similar to them and i i 100 percent have it so like mm-hmm. i i don't i don't want i want to make that absolutely cl- 
clear. Um, but I think Tristan, there are parts of Tristan I very much relate to, and there are parts of Byron I very much relate to. And I think those are, those are the reasons why I think I, I explored their chapters in the way I did, because I saw a lot of myself, I, I saw a lot of myself in Tristan. Mm. Um, but I also saw a lot of myself in Byron and the tendencies and, and the weaknesses of these characters. Um, and I, I, I don't have a brother, but I do have sisters, sisters that I did not get along with at all. My, my, me and my older sister did not get along with each other until we were adults. It took until we were adults to, to have any kind of positive relationship. Um, and so uh, like, I, there's a lot that I see there. Um, but, uh, but I, there's parts of every single one of these characters that I relate to on some level. Um, yeah. And of course we talked about like how we understood Victoria the most. So I guess that would be my answer as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Victoria is a good answer, right? For sure. Um, I, I guess, I guess if we're going outside of, um, breakthrough, then I would definitely want to mention, um, Dauntless just because like the, the pure dad energy just spoke <laughs> to my soul uh, and not sure. just dad energy, but having a premature baby and, and like the, the subsequent, like that, that just was like, oh, Wild Bow has decided to target me specifically with this, right, with this interlude. Um, so yeah, I, I connected quite a lot, quite a lot to Dauntless. And there was mm-hmm. that time I spent a year trapped inside of a time bubble. So, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, totally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great question, though. I really like that. Um, what's next? Okay, Tasarwat asks. I noticed that you have a high proportion of trans and generally queer fans, myself included. Any thoughts on why this might be? Has having a diverse fan base changed anything about about the way you think about podcasting or analysis? Um, yeah, we, we do. And I don't want to take any credit for this at all, Matt. I think this is <laughs> this is the book. I think honestly, this is the book, I think. And, and I don't want to speculate on why, because I am I am not trans or, or queer and I don't have those experiences. Um, but I think this book speaks to a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And it seems to speak to a lot of trans people. Um, and I, I think that's wonderful and powerful. Um, I. I I like it's been it's been so wonderful like I I am I am proud of our community I'm proud that we are a place where people can feel open and comfortable and and we've had all different kinds of people come in and I'm very proud of of our role and everyone in our community Matthias who you guys saw um Elliot Ruben um Jarvis and Steven and Brian um I think we've tried to foster an, an open welcoming community and I'm very very proud of that it's like it's not something it's not something that like we, we didn't plan on having a community, right? Like we, we, we just wanted to, we just wanted to like do podcasts yeah, do <laughs> and, then, thing and, and, and this, and this happened. And um, yeah, I, I don't have anything really to add to Scott's beautiful answer there. I, I think, um, you know, we, we've, I've, I've been able to witness a lot of, um, you know, explanations from, people in the discord as to what, what it is about pair humans specifically that spoke to them. And, and, um, I, I, like, I, I, I agree, I agree with you basically that, yeah, it's, it's, it's in the stories and all we, all we've done mm-hmm. is to be, um, open and accepting and, and try yeah. to foster that in our community. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I still kind of, I think, I think us saying let's make a discord was like the watershed <laughs> moment when we shifted from being a podcast to being a community uh-huh. and, um, all the, the, the responsibilities that come with that. And I'm, I'm very proud of, of the community that, that all of us have built and, and I hope, I hope people enjoy being a part of it. Mm-hmm. I, I do. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you want to do that one or, um, to Sarwat's also asking me to ship people, <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine. Uh, my my opinions towards shipping have cooled, a, or well, I mean, cooled. Like I I don't get as up in arms about it. I, I, it's fine. Um, characters that would have made a good couple, that but that were never met, never to be. Um, I don't know, Matt. You got anything for this? I it's funny because I I for a while I was pretty sure that Rain and Aaron were gonna like work it out, and was I was like when it was kind of obvious that they weren't, I was like bummed about that um Mm -hmm. um i I think it was very fitting that they didn't though yeah yeah i think like i I get i get being bummed in the moment but um i i think it was also really interesting i mean i'm making this a much more serious question than it was meant to be but i I think it was really (laughs) interesting how when when the story started weld and sveta were together and, and we were all like you know yes yes this is great we love this like the like the they're the 
they're the the heart, right? Like we're so happy. These two characters, we love both of them. We're so happy they're together. This is perfect. And mm-hmm. then it's gradually kind of starts to be shaky. And then oh oh God, well drops the bombshell, and you're just like, oh no, this is mm-hmm. this is so bad. I wish this had. I, I wish I were dead. Um, and that like that was just a, a great example, I think, of like what you can do with relationships in a story. Not e- even if you're tearing them apart, you can still do really interesting things. Yeah, yeah. No, I I I, I agree with that. Um, <laughs> Wild Bo saying Jester Ashley, which is of <laughs> course, which is of course the perfect answer. Um, <laughs> uh, I thought they did end up together. Uh, well, we didn't no, see I, it, I'm, did we? I'm, no, no, we didn't. We didn't see no. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, which Ashley though? No, oh, touche. Yeah. Touche. Still a chance. What you're saying is there's a chance. There's a chance. All yeah. right. Uh, <laughs> Seer Graug says, which character arc in Ward was your favorite? Um, they have a few questions, w- which, uh, if you had one of breakthroughs powers, which would you want? And which minor character would you like to see an interlude from? Those are all hard questions here, Graug. Um, mm-hmm. Which character arc was was my favorite? Um, definitely a fan of Rain. Um, I mean, Victoria sort of has to always be default number one there, but but uh, we're yeah. talking about non protagonist characters. Uh, I don't know, Scott. Do you have anything off the top of your head? I, I really like Tristan and Byron's, and, and the yeah. reason I like Tristan and Byron's is because it's it's the type of thing that like gives the illusion of being complete like halfway through the story like after after the we we have their interludes we learned this past and then we end that arc on byron being like i i forgive you and 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 they're they're better both like they've they've come to a place where they seem to be better with each other and and then the book says oh you think that was the end well no, it wasn't because that's not things are not that easy. That's not the way this works. Sorry. Um, and, and it kind of loops around again in, to to the tragedy of Tristan. Um, and I, I just I don't know. I like I, it kind of fools you in that way. And I really like that. Yeah. You know, even as we're talking, though, I'm like, I feel like I'm giving short shrift to Ashley and Kenzie and Seta, yeah. who are all characters I mean, who I just adore. So they're all wonderful. Like, yeah. yeah, I loved all their arcs. But yeah, if you got to ask me a favorite, I would say. But I mean, Reigns is great too. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Right. As for, as for breakthroughs powers, like I I'm on record as just wanting to fly um, and having mm-hmm. a super awesome force field on top of flight would, would uh, be pretty cool. So I just, I just go with Victoria. Yeah. Uh, Victoria's got a pretty sweet set of powers. Yeah. For sure. Minor character that I would like to see an interview an interlude from um, uh, snuff. Snuff. Okay. Good answer. Um, hmm, 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 <laughs> this is bad audio, but I, I'm, I'm, nothing's coming to mind we, we, here. We got a lot of little interludes, you know, we got a lot we of did. interludes in the story. I tried, we I tried did. to count the other day and I was just like, I got distracted and didn't finish. <laughs> That's how many there are. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, gosh. Uh, Jess <laughs> suggests for Kate. That's a good uh, answer. N- Nandy, Nandy suggests Caden. Caden <laughs> Nutpick Perfect. suggests Ratcatcher. Actually, that's a good answer. Yeah. Right oh, Ratcatcher didn't get one. Yeah. Yeah. Chicken, that's my answer. Brady suggests Chicken Large. Okay, I have to stop. I like Chicken Large though. That <laughs> that would have been good. Yeah. Uh, all right. Moving on to Stronger Bird, who says, "Did Scott's thinker power turn up any big Scott speculations that we never got to hear about on the show? Uh, not right ones. I I kind of consciously decided. Okay. So a couple things." We were talking at the beginning of the show about the complexity of this book versus the other one. This is a book that I think is just naturally harder to predict, um, except unless if you're the person who predicted uh, uh, Lab Rat, which continues to be like the most (laughs) astounding like call ever. Uh. Um, I also think I I kind of consciously tried not to play that game as much. Um, I mean, there were there were moments where you and I made predictions, right? Those happened. But I wasn't like when we had a Scott speculation section of the show, I would spend upwards of an hour being like, all right, I got to get my predictions for this week. Think about stuff. And I, I like, I would go back, I would go back over the notes that Matt wrote and I I would really spend a lot of time on these prediction sections. And I kind of didn't want to do that this time around. So I consciously chose not to do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I basically 
for the first time started to think about predictions and, and you, you, know, ma- you nailed some, I, I, I nailed a few. I don't, I don't know what my track record was is the funny thing. Like I don't, yeah. I didn't, I didn't pay attention to it, but like I refused to believe Vista was dead and I thought Tristan would die. Yeah. And I was right about both of those. I don't remember. I probably made a lot of wrong ones that I don't remember because, you know, self-serving ego, but, um, <laughs> Some would call that a prediction and some people would call that denial that just happened to be correct one time. Yes. Well, <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, strong, stronger bird also asks, are there any favorite scenes or chapters you, you have that most people probably wouldn't list as a favorite of theirs? So what's your favorite chapter that other people wouldn't call a favorite, Matt? Oh, this is the wild boat question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's hard to remember individual chapters. Like my brain immediately wants to go to interludes, but I think most people would probably list just about any interlude as their favorite. Yeah. I mean, I probably like a lot of the like downtime chapters where, where you're just getting dialogue with, or, or, you know, um, like, like even toward the beginning of the story when you're just kind of setting things up and it's quiet and slow and, you know, self-consciously slow and intentionally slow. Um, mm-hmm. I, I like that. I, I can't name like a chapter, but, but I, I like that kind of stuff and, and that rarely gets, you know, talked about and it's important, right? It's important to, to set that structure in place so that you can lean yeah, on it later. Yeah. I'm thinking of, uh, I'm looking this up. I, this is not from memory. I'm thinking of black 13 one, which is like the chapter after the huge Vista isn't dead reveal. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just like Vicky, like just like working out mm-hmm. <laughs> and and I think she meets with Darnall during this and it's definitely a down a down chapter like after the end of a big part of the story before things start ramping up again and I agree those are those are some those are some nice ones in terms of exciting parts I think like the 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 fun, the finale kind of the resolution of the of the goddess section to me just worked like gangbusters for me but sure, but I think maybe sure. other people would say that too so mm-hmm. um, yeah cool all right, moving on. Um, Jenny D says, if you could pick any point in time to set the story of parahumans, where and when would it be? How would it affect powers differently? For example, Kenzie in the 1800s. So we're doing <laughs> sort of like steampunk Kenzie. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I, I go ahead, Scott. I just think the past would be fun. I think mm-hmm. the past would be more fun than doing like the 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 future. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Like so, how does a, how does a world how does a how does a, a 1700s America react to superpowers? Because mm-hmm. like I I feel like so much of so much of the the story and setting is defined by modern comics and superheroes. So yeah, it, it would just be it would just be really interesting. Right. I I um. It's funny because I for some I don't know why I thought this, but before Ward started, I believed that it was going to happen. Like like after like some kind of massive civilizational collapse, like a hundred years into the future where, Mm -hmm. where like basically everything was now feudal and technology had regressed. And that was like, I've always, ever since I thought that was true, um, I I was like, Oh yeah, that's definitely going to be, it's definitely good. That that, that would definitely be awesome. So basically that's sort of like saying uh, the feudal era basically. So like, yeah, like knights and, and super, superpowers. That's my answer. That's cool. That's cool. I like it. All right. Final question, Matt, uh, from Jordy, who is it's actually three questions. So nice. Okay. One, Jordy, you snuck some in there. <laughs> um, Matt, you said in the last episode that your favorite part of anything is subject to drift. Is, st- is Capricorn drama still holding the golden slot? Um, like in the golden slot is like my favorite part of the story. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's definitely way up near the top. Like I've, I think I've mentioned it in the course of this conversation as something I just love a handful of times. Um, I love, I love this. I love anything with brothers and I love the theme of forgiveness and it, and it, and as I discussed, it has a huge positive impact on my life. So mm-hmm. it, it's hard to beat that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then <clears throat> Jordy also asks us about uh, adaptations, which you've kind of already answered. Um, but this this final question is if you could see one scene lovingly adapted, what would you choose? Um, so we're not adapting Ward, we're just adapting one scene. What would it be, Matt? What would the one scene be? Oh my god. Um from from Ward. Yeah. Um Oh God. This is this is such a big story. 
<laughs> I mean, I, okay. I, I think I'm I'm gonna go with something that would just be very visually uh, stunning, and so I'm going to go with either the moment where um, Dauntless is first kind of uh, tightened, or the moment toward the very end where, which we even talked about at the time, where uh, you know Colin basically kills the Seamurg like a badass, and then is standing in the shattered city with these gigantic titans looming all around him that that would be i want to see i want to see that i want to see that it's done it's so funny because like i i love that answer and i totally agree with you but like my brain immediately went to like small Uh like intense like character focused scenes like and, and i think that's so weird like like I, I like you're absolutely right that that would be those would be the perfect scenes to adapt. But for whatever reason, my head is like uh, Kenzie's dinner. I want to see yeah. that. Like, I want to well, see sure. that scene. Um, Like, I, like I, I it's it's I don't know. It's just it's just the way our brains work differently. So, yeah, no, it's a uh, it's it's a good uh, it's a good point. Mm-hmm. I mean, like Ken, like Ashley's if people are talking Eclipse arc, like Ashley's confrontation of Jay seeing that scene would be yeah. fucking phenomenal um yeah like just a small like like the (laughs) the fucking the fucking uh diner dinner with carol where sveta like loses her shit at vicky's parents um Mm. you know like these i don't know i don't know why my brain is like no these small character driven scenes is what i want to see not like the big huge fucking awesome battles that would look great visually i don't know i I mean i don't disagree i think i think it'd be super cool to see like the emotionality of some really great performer carrying Mm -hmm. off what was actually going on dramatically in these scenes right because yeah that's i mean i think that's the re like that fundamentally is part of the reason why we want to see adaptations at all like like why is it that that, why is it that it's a perennial conversation to say you know to talk about adaptations of parahumans like why Mm -hmm. why do we want that so badly well i mean we we want to see we want to see this stuff realized but i think both both the epic action and like the really dramatic moments we want it we want someone to kind of embody that and make us cry by channeling that for us yeah um, yeah I, I i mean all those things you just listed i would love to see those too yeah it's it, i don't want an adaptation of this bu- this book no that would be terrible don't want it but um could you adapt like 700 individual <laughs> scenes for me yeah yeah <laughs> please please do yeah. that there you go <laughs> love it love it all right um that is it for our sent in question so if anyone has any questions um, I think we got a little time, right? I mean, we're running long, but that's, we're perpetually running long. Um, yeah, we're, and, and I can't let go. So, you know, yeah, yeah. And then we have to move on to the end part of the show, which is, <laughs> it's just going to fuck me up. So, uh, any, any questions, um, mm. before we move on to that and mm. Matt, let's talk about something while we wait for those to come in since there's a little bit of a delay. Okay. How, how, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I think it's starting to sink in. Oh, it's finally now th- starting to sink think, in two and a half finally, hours into the final episode it's starting. Yeah. I mean, like it's, it's funny. Cause I like, I immediately can, cons- I immediately tell myself like, yeah, but like, but like, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean I can't still like, you know, be part of the community and, and read the stories and, and uh, right. talk about them with people. And like, that's, that's, I think maybe the thing, the thing for me has always been that like, I am, I'm just a fan of Parahumans and Wildbow mm-hmm. who happened to start a podcast with his friend who hadn't read them yet and now has. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so like for me, I'm, I'm just like, okay, I guess, uh, I guess I'll have to pursue my fandom by other means now. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. I like that. Uh, so we got a question from Kifru here, excluding Wildbow's completed and as of this recording story settings, is there a particular genre or type of story you are interested in seeing the Wildbow touch on? Any particular reason why? Well, my uh, my answer to this before was a police procedural or a procedural at least. And um, um, he's kind of doing that. No spoilers in the most recent one, kind of. Um, so th- that's done. I-, I would like to see some sci-fi stuff. I think some like some space opera stuff would be really interesting. Um, and, and yeah. a, a departure for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I Wild can already does Star of, Trek. What? Wild Boat does Star Trek. Wild Boat does Star Trek. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can, I can very much, 
uh, I don't want to say I can imagine that because I'm certain that I can't, but like, I, I know, I, I know his, the, the way he approaches things, that that would be delightful. Mm-hmm. I just want to see like a really tightly plotted heist with like four characters, you know? Oh yeah. Like the three arcs long, just like <laughs> yeah. first arc planning, second arc execution, third arc. Oh shit. It all went wrong. Yeah. I love right. it. Like, 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 like reservoir dogs, you know, like, like yeah. very, very narrow and focused. Um, I, I we're, we are having to sort of scan for, um, mm. for, um, ha- uh, where can I get the music from the podcast? Matt yeah, SoundCloud. Yeah. I think it's still called the daily planet. Though. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we can place that link in places where people can find it because it's not, not easy to find, but yeah, I think it's yeah. called the daily planet. Yeah. How are, uh, yeah, Scott, Scott, how are you doing? How are you I'm doing? good. I'm good. I'm getting, I'm starting to get a little emotional. I, I um, think that, I think you're processing this differently from me. Oh, am I? I, I don't know. I just, I can't accept that it's over and thus <laughs> it's not, I'm not sad. That <laughs> <That's> story <laughs> is about acceptance. You can't do this. Oh no. Oh no. Um, <laughs> it's over. Uh, um, Sorry, I'm, oh. I'm trying to go through. Do you have any thoughts on Pale so far? Fucking fantastic. I oh, actually yeah. haven't read I haven't read the chapter that came out yesterday. Full disclosure. But yeah, I mean, I've I love loved it. what I've read. Yeah. Kassar Watt <laughs> says, has, has Wild Boy ever made you cry? I'm, I'm sure he has. I just can't think of. He's made he's made so many different emotions that I'm like crying is just one of many, you know. Ashley's death made me cry. Ashley's okay. death made me cry. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the Weaver Dice radio podcast? Uh, that's the one in which they just kind of talk about Weaver Dice, right? Like just generally. I think it's a really cool idea. I listened to some of the first episode. I haven't listened to much more of that, but um, I, I, it's a cool idea. I like it a lot. Um, all right. Uh, let's. Do you want to move on? Yeah, I think we can move on because some pe- people are asking about Weaver Dice, which is what we're going to talk about in a second anyway. Sure, sure. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, all right. So um, the, I guess, final section basically is what's next, Scott? What is next for us, for us specifically, for Doof Media? Uh-huh. Where are we going? So uh, here's the things that we're still doing. Um, we are still going to do the Doof cast every week, which is doing deconstructing directors. We're doing our Council of Doof. We're trying to find the best movies out there. We're doing an episode on um Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse this Friday. I'm very excited about that one. We are still doing Kingslingers, uh, the Stephen King podcast, which is now uh, after this week moving on to book four of the series, which is a big old big one. So it's never a better time to join that. Um, we're for, we're into book four, but the other three are considerably shorter than, than this book is. So we're still doing all of that. Um, yeah. And let me just let me just help help everyone out here and just s- say this just. In your podcatcher that you're holding, in your phone or whatever, just go uh-huh. to the thing and type in the Doofcast if you've never done that before. Yeah. And find the Doofcast. And then it'll be there if you haven't done that. And then you can just look through. And we've done like hundreds of episodes. You'll find <laughs> something that we've talked about that you would find fun. And, and, and I hope you enjoy that. And then do the same thing for Kingslingers because you're going to read The Dark Tower. Yeah, because it's eventually cause, so, so like as much <laughs> as much as I like I, I like worm enough to make Scott do we've got worm. He likes the Dark Tower enough to make me do Kingslingers. That should tell you like the level on which he likes it, which to me is enough of a sales pitch. Like if somebody tells me like that's the level on which they like something, I'm like, all right, I'm in. Mm-hmm. You have sold me. You, have, you you are committed. Yeah, yeah. That that's great, great salesmanship, Matt. Totally agree. Um, the Doofcast is also where you'll find all of our book club episodes, which um, which is uh, <laughs> I, I I I'm so proud of those book clubs. I love them. We we just did A Way of Kings, the first story in the Stormlight Archive, and if if you we read other books, so. Oh yeah, Matt. Um, the chat is saying watch Buffy. That's weird. Should you? I I feel like you should do that. Yeah, but you d- you haven't made me do a podcast about it yet. I told you. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, it, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Um, <laughs> as far as this feed, the feed that you are listening to stuff on right now, um, stay subscribed. 
stay subscribed. We have a very special episode coming out next week that you are definitely going to want to hear. I can pretty much guarantee that. Um, and I guess it's time to talk about Weaver Dice, Matt. <laughs> yeah, um, there will be more Weaver Dice. Yes, there. Uh, we are at the very least going to conclude stuff with our Vegas characters, or at least season one of stuff with our Vegas characters, right? Or yeah, um, whatever season we're on. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I, I don't even know anymore. We we left we left our Vegas characters on the hook. We're gonna conclude that. We have to. Um, there's too much going on there, too much we wanted to do. We just flat out didn't have time, folks, and we feel bad about that. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work for Matt. It's a ton of work for Matt to plan these things. It's a ton of work for Matt to edit these things, and we just haven't had time. But word is over now, and we have some time. So um, that is coming. It will not be next week. Next week is something else. Stay subscribed. But we've, more Weaver Dice is coming. It will be right here on this feed. We've also got some other stuff coming that we can't talk about yet because we haven't finalized it. But we are looking at having some one off episodes with some special guests um, that to just talk about Worm or talk about Ward a little bit with some guests, uh, some content creators out there that are reading these books that we thought would be fun to have a chat with. So um, we are not going to be actively covering a book on this feed, but I, I still think we're going to be dropping stuff on it fairly regularly. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, there's stuff like the, the weekly pair humans online threads, which as soon as I saw those, I had the thought like, you know, that would be fun to, for us to talk about at some point. So like, that's just, mm -hmm. that's just an idea of the sort of thing. I'm not saying definitely going to do that specifically, but that's just the, like an idea of the sort of thing where, you know, th th there's always, there's always a space to talk about pair humans here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's our plan going forward. Um, right now, the Dark Tower podcast is scheduled to run until uh, about April of next year. Um, so we probably will not be doing another like big, long follow a book read podcast at the same time as that. So it's going to be a little while if we do return to a wild bow work. However, however, we have pale reflections. We have Elliot and Rubens dive into pale. Um we have deconstructing worm, which will dive back into worm. Um, decomposing, not deconstructing, sorry. Decomposing worm. I'm gonna get that wrong so many times. Um, so I think I think if you're if you're if Doof Media has become the place for Wildbow content for you, just because Matt and I are kind of stepping back from it for a little while, um, does not mean that it's that Doof Media will be devoid of Wildbow content. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think everyone in our community is there for Wild Bow. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so it yeah. sort of has to be thus, right? I think we've said we're we're in the Wild Bow business, <laughs> and we're gonna we're gonna remain that way uh, for this foreseeable future. So, yeah. Um, but I think that's like I, I'm I'm really excited. I'm really yeah. excited. Um, I I like I'm ready for a little bit of a break. But I am so proud of of the work that our friends are doing. Um, when we started this show, Matt, we didn't have friends that were doing work that we could say, OK, we're done. But go listen to Elliot or go listen to Matthias and Clarence. Go listen to Ruben. Like we didn't have that. And it's so cool that at the end of this thing, we have that where we can say we're going to take a little step back. Um, you've got you've got a, a secret project that you've been working on. Yeah, that, that um, I don't know how I don't know when that's coming. I wouldn't yeah. say soon. No, I would. I, I, I think I think that all I all, all I really want to say about that right now is like I'm I'm I've, I've been working on it quite a bit for the last few months and I'm I'm going to be taking this time off from, you know, from this project. I'm going to be just channeling all, all those extra hours right into this project. Um, I guess I guess I'll I'll say like it's original content. It's it's original yeah, it's, fiction content. It's something we've never ever done before yeah, on it's, on it's, this network. So right. it's not covering another thing. And 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 like I've always wanted to do this sort of thing. Like mm -hmm. so, um, I'm 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 really excited about it. I'm working really hard on it. I don't know when it will happen. Um, and this is not really an announcement. This is just me sort of talking about how, you know, now that this project is over. I'm going to be just pouring a lot more energy into that new thing. And so I'm excited about that. I'm looking forward yeah. to doing that. And I have, I'm trying to say word this in a way that doesn't reveal what it is, but I, I he is 
showed me, Matt has showed me some of it, and I am very excited not only as someone who's going to be helping produce it, but as someone who's going to get to consume it. I'm very excited. So um, I can't wait for you guys. We will have a we will have an announcement when we're ready to have an announcement. Um, but we just wanted to kind of build hype for that because j- we're 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 workaholics. You guys know we're workaholics. We're not going to stop working just because we're not doing this podcast. We're just going to fill that time with other stuff to work right. on. Um, so get get excited. Get excited. It's, yes. it's an exciting time, um, but it's also the end, Matt, because it is we're out of stuff to talk about for the last time. And we kind of got to say our goodbyes now. And this is when I'm going to start to get really emotional. Um, this has been. I, I, I am I'm having I am having difficulty saying the words. This has been a unique and wonderful experience over these past two and a half years. I, when Matt and I started podcasting, we never believed we would have the, 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 the community we had, we would never believe people would want to listen to what we had to say. And it's been like, it's been a, an absolute pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to talk with you guys every day. And, and I'm talking to you that our, our patrons that support us in chat and that we talk in chat all the time. I'm talking about those of you that um, talk to us on the Parahuman subreddit. I'm talking to those of you that have just silently listened to the show throughout the whole run of it and have never commented and, and just, just like to absorb the content. You all made this possible for us. Like seeing how many people were enjoying it kept us going when we were tired um, and, and we, and like our weeks were stuffed and we just didn't feel like doing a podcast and I didn't feel like editing a podcast. It's, it's because of all of you. And I, I am so thankful that you invited both of us into your ears <laughs> and your brain and your lives. Like the, it, it, I, we record a long show, so it's not just like 30 minutes a week. We're like, it's two and a half hours a week. Mm-hmm. And I I am I'm stunned by your generosity. I'm stunned by your kindness. I I I just loved experiencing this book with y'all. I really did. Um I I will never like even if 20 years from now we're not podcasting anymore, even if 20 years from now my dream of getting to do this full time has not come to fruition, I will never forget this time. Um and I, I'm trying not to look at chat because I, d- I don't want to read it as I'm saying this or I'm just going to get totally destroyed. But I there, I've said my piece. You can go now, Matt. Yeah, that was beautiful, Scott. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I never, um, I, I don't think I've ever really understood the, the phrase. Um, it's been a privilege until now, but really it's been a privilege to get to be the guy who does this um, because this is so this has been so fun for me. This has been um, mm-hmm. a source of of joy, of fulfillment, of I, I would I would not hesitate to say like literal spiritual growth, whatever that means to you. Just the mm-hmm. opportunity to think my way and talk my way through these ideas, and, and and to do it in this dynamic way where yes, I'm 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 interacting with Scott, which is extremely rewarding, but I'm also interacting with all of you. And, um, just this, the, I don't know, the feeling of belonging and, um, just, just overall goodness that this has brought to my life oh, can't be understated really. Um, and yeah, it's, it really, it really does in a sense suck that this is, is over. Um, but I think the reason why I'm not too broken up about it is, like we were saying a minute ago, we, we have, we have built uh, sort of a, a structure around the stuff that we've done that now supports, you know, the, the ongoing discussion, right? The discussion continues. We're no longer the center of it Yeah. to whatever degree we were, but, but it continues without us being the center of it. And I'm, so, yeah, I, that's, that's perfect. That's perfect. I, I, I'm so proud of that i'm so i i'm so happy to hand the reins off to to other people um because i i like i trust all these people to give you great content like they're going to yeah um and i 
look, I don't I don't know what the future is going to hold for Matt and I. I don't know when we're going to come back to Wild Bow, what we're going to do when we're there. I don't know with the success of this 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 media company that we've created. I don't I don't know. But as Victoria said, I, I think it'll be good. And we're going to press on no matter what. And there's always going to be a way forward with all of you folks. And thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. See, now you got me emotional, Scott. <laughs> I, I laugh when I'm uncomfortable in case you haven't noticed. Oh, that was, um, that was good. All right. Is that it, Scott? That is it. Well, then that's all we had for you on We've Got Ward. You guys were all part of this show. So thank you so, so very much for everything you did to make it so amazing. We really couldn't have done anything like this without you. You can always continue to reach out to us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or on our Twitter account at gotwormpod. Especially now that we're done with Ward, you can find our personal Twitters where we say whatever inane bullshit that comes to our heads <laughs> at scottdaily85. And Matt's is, of course, as it has always been, <laughs> at Moradina Flopnopnism. <laughs> Uh, we've got Ward is now over, but we still have tons of other shows that need your support. So if you want to help out Pale Reflections or Decomposing Worm, consider donating to our Patreon account. Supporting us on Patreon at the $1 level gets you access to our Discord, where all of our other patrons are already eagerly devouring Pale, as well as tons of other incredible conversations. Um, as we, as, and as always, please continue continue to make sure you keep supporting Wildbo via his Patreon at patreon.com slash Wildbo. This was his incredible world. We were just cherishing our time in it, and he's going on to create more of them. Mm -hmm. Special thanks this week to new patrons, Bidoofs, Gotmaster Gray, Mario P, Kellen, Farallax, Benjamin J, Galloping Computer, Tim S, and Fern F, new doof dancers, Philip G, Silverhand X, Numerous, and Moxter and new doof warrior reader. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I don't know what I, it's just, it's, it, it never ceases to be kind of humbling week after week. And, um, so once again, I'm, I'm humbled and thank you. And we hope to see you in the discord. Some of you, I already recognize your names as mm -hmm. newcomers. So welcome. Yep. And I hope you have a great time. And thank you to everyone that has been a part of our Patreon or donated to our show over these last few years. Thanks to those of you that shared our podcast, to those of you that rated and reviewed us, to those of you that listened. Thanks to all of you. Thank you so, so, so much. That's it. That, that's it. Goodbye. Goodbye.